can you name can you name the topics let me ask surya no then the purpose of attending this class is not served there is no point in attending the class or reading the material if you are not able to recall at least something to clear the examination what is required concept content revision and practice all these four features are interlinked and if you do not satisfy any of this feature will be very difficult to clear the examination both pt and mains and yes of course the interview editorial discussion can help you only when you revise it properly my job is to help you to understand the concept and, and provide you some content and it is your job to go home and make some notes and revise it properly and not only that revise as well as write answers <clears throat> otherwise the purpose will not be served otherwise what we will do is we will be doing something called ritualization yes pfi remission fine remission yes remission can you recall something related to remission a topic which i have taught in the previous class remission remission three types of remission constitutional ipc and regulatory constitutional statutory and administrative can you relate that topic with some kind of news which happened recently within a couple of days maybe i think uh, friday rajiv gandhi absolutely and why the court gave that ruling the court while setting this prisoner free cited or referred to a judgment which judgment was that which judgment perari valen that is how you re relate things this perari valen case i have discussed right in the context of power of governor and remission secondly in the context of gujarat case we discussed the various aspect of remission right so what you need to do is whatever you are studying try to link it now when you read a news item with respect to this relief of uh, uh, the uh, convicted with respect to rajiv gandhi case you will come to know why this has happened the, the newspaper will only refer this perari valen case happened but now you know what is perari valen case why the uh, the supreme court said the governor has to abide by the decision of consular ministers that is how you link things and governor you know that governor is a an office of constitution which is always in the news in fact we have a, another issue with respect to governor linking with various topics using one information in multiple areas a student who is smart enough will be able to do that it requires revision why it? because the more you revise the more you will get different ideas your your mind seems to open up you can apply it in multiple areas without revision this class will not be helpful in the previous class i have told you that four to five question directly came from ed in gs2 and not only that lot of things which we which we teach can be helpful in answering questions properly upf in in 2022 mains asked two question dealing with case laws remember 
Representative People Act, and Environmental Justice. So case laws are important in the sense that directly they are asking. But even if they are not directly asking, case laws are important to provide value addition to your answer, to substantiate your answer. The editorial discussion, the lecture as well as the topics are prepared in such a way that a comprehensive perspective, the right perspective will be given to student. Perspective in the sense that the way you should look at a particular thing. You must have your own opinion. The newspaper might have its own opinion. But what UPF requires? A matured opinion. A matured viewpoint. That is what we are trying to give you. Right? So, the first topic we are going to discuss Hate speech. What is that? I think my quote a little bit lengthy. Hate speech. Do you remember anything about this recently? I hope you are reading newspapers. Why are we discussing this hate speech? Asam Khan convicted. Fine. Then? Azam Khan. Yes. Then? Supreme Court? Guidelines. Or put it differently. Binding direction. Yes. So, recently, the Supreme Court has given binding directions to the Union of India. Yes or no? No. Why? It, the directions are applied to only three states, including one UT. Uttar Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Delhi. Even in dream direction. In the sense that the case is not closed. Right? This are, it is not something which is applicable to what? Entire country. But again, people who wants to proceed, who wants to uh, <clears throat> in people who wants to challenge or let's say There are many incidents of hate speech in this country. And this incidence of hate speech is not limited to UP, Uttarakhand, and Delhi. Although the Supreme Court's direction is related to with these three states, if actions on hate speech is not taken by the police in other states too, the people can approach the court. That Supreme Court has provided, provided this guideline and direction, and this is not happening. Right? But the point is this. What exactly is hate speech? That is the beginning point of our discussion. I want to ask you whether there is any legal definition of hate speech. Any legal definition? Any law? Is there any law dealing with hate speech? Section? Section 123A, does it deal with hate speech? No. Sedition. That is sedition. Sedition is not hate speech. Sedition is not hate speech. Sedition is an offense against, keep this in mind. Sedition is an offense against the state. State means the government and its instrumentalities. Hate speech is an offense against individuals or community. There cannot be any hate speech against the state. I am not saying this. I am quoting the United Nations report. Right? Because it, this distinction is very much necessary. Because sedition 
on a fundamental level fetishism means what incitement to violence incitement to violence against government established by law this is it this fetishism in ipc is under a chapter called offenses against the state this word violence is very much important because every hate speech will not be dealing will not be related to violence we will see that again <clears throat> so it's not fetishism hate speech is not defined under any statute whether it is the general penal law ipc crpc or indian evidence act or whether it is <clears throat> sector specific laws like representation representation of people act protection of civil rights act etc and others not defined the reason why it is not defined so far in a law or not defined by the supreme court so far there is a reason for that why this has not de been defined that we will see at, at the last why this has not been defined but the point is no legal definition exists for hate speech but but for the purpose of our analysis we should have a working definition which means something which is commonly accepted so i am going to tell you a few definition of hate speech on the basis of that we will proceed <clears throat> black's law dictionary black's law dictionary what is that black's law dictionary a dictionary dealing with legal terms so publisher's name is blacks or black right black's law dictionary defines hate speech as a speech that carries no meaning other than inciting hatred against people based on some characteristics write this down it is not given in the booklet i think so hate speech is something a speech that carries no meaning other than no meaning other than <coughs> creating or inciting hatred towards towards a group of people based on based on their specific characteristics this is what the black slow dictionary defines now what what is important here no meaning which means the per any speech any language any word has a meaning has a purpose to achieve in fact i am teaching you i am using word i am using language what is my purpose to teach you for that you understand things but because of that i am teaching you my language has a meaning here it is says this speech a speech which have no meaning in the sense that the only purpose of that speech is to incite hatred incite hatred against group of people based on specific characteristic now this group of people can also be an individual correct key word is hatred sedition deals with incitement to violence key word is hatred sedition is not the same as hate speech specific characteristics what specific characteristics anything yes race caste religion language cuisine culture class political identity food ethnicity economic position social status region the purpose of a speech 
the purpose, the only intent, the only purpose of a speech is to incite hatred. There is no meaningful message in that speech. That is what differentiates between a speech which is not hateful and a ha speech which is hateful. And one thing you have to keep in mind, this hate speech does not mean language only. The hate speech, the speech, the term speech comprehends or covers written, spoken, signs, visible representation and anything. Anything which can convey a message. That is what the speech is. This speech is not limited to written speech or let's say spoken speech, spoken language, right? So the magnitude or let's say the, the, it's a very broad concept because there are many signs in even our society which is not accepted, acceptable. The society does not agree with that. It does not mean that only a person who can speak is only providing what we say, speech which is hateful. So we need to provide a kind of definition or let's say a workable definition which covers everything. There are movies which also tend to promote hate. There are books, there are social media posts, there are comedy. The drama, I mean the point you are saying, through anything a message can be conveyed, right? Everything comes into that because we cannot limit ourselves to linguistics, the language which we use. So hate speech, the hate, the speech is very comprehensive. <coughs> so this is one definition given by Black's Law Dictionary. Our pur purpose of this definition is to Whenever a question comes in the examination, you use it. Right? Because this is something which you can understand and write. But another definition is also given by the Law Commission of India. Law Commission 267th report. Law Commission. Because in one case called Pravasi Bhalai Sangatan, 2014. Pravasi, P R A V A S I, Pravasi Bhalai Sangatan. I'll discuss this case later because we have something called the jurisprudence, which means how the Supreme Court has dealt with the issue of hate speech so far. The evolution we will study. But I just want to tell you the Law Commission of India has also given a definition in his 267th report. Law Commission says speech which is directed against a specific category of people for inciting hatred against them. Law Commission 267th report says, Law Commission 267th report says, hate speech is a speech which is directed against a group of people in order to incite hatred against them on the basis of specific characteristics. So ultimately, it seems to be similar. You can either use law commission or you can use black law. But 267 report might, uh, you know, it, it has some added, added advantage because it is a law commission is what? Statutory body, executive body. Which body is that? Tell me. Law Commission of India is? Neither statutory, statutory. You are saying statutory? Executive. Fine. Do you, have you read anything about Law Commission recently? Have you read anything about Law Commission recently? Within, let's say, uh, three to four days? Yes or no? No. No. Recently, Government of India constituted 
not constituted appointed the members and chairman of the 22nd law commission of india 21st law commission 2018 came to an end government did not appoint law commission government 2020 constituted law commission mark this word constituted which means by a notification government said we have constituted the law commission after 2 years in 2022 government of india appointed law commission chairman and members law commission is generally appointed for 3 years it's an executive body which means the government of india appoints first law commission of india is when was the first law commission appointed under which act i am teaching you history these days tell me bolo mac farman nidhi surya and Eighteen thirty-three Charter Act, Lord Macaulay, First Law Commission. See, this is how you link things. The purpose of the Law Commission is to <coughs> provide suggestions with respect to reform in law. Two sixty-seven Law Commission was tasked with identifying and defining hate speech and provide measures or to suggest measures to deal with hate speech. this law commission might be given the task of dealing with uniform civil code every law commission has some specific terms of reference right law commission is a very important uh entity as far as your examination is concerned anyway so law commission also provide a definition this is also provide definition but neither of the definition in fact the report given by this law commission has not been incorporated in the existing law which means we have some we have some legal provisions to deal with speeches which, which are hateful mark my word but not hate speech per se there are some provisions in the indian penal code and some other laws or you know which practically deal with speeches which are hateful or speeches which incite hatred that means we have some laws to deal with the menace of hate speech despite having those laws supreme court has to issue this direction these laws are not new right these laws are there in even pre independence times so we have more than 70 days of sorry uh, 70 years of independence the point i am trying to say there are some laws there are some provisions in the indian penal code to deal with various aspects of speech which are hateful which incite hatred etc but despite them being in the statute book despite them being the responsibility of the administration especially the police to implement them properly the supreme court had to step in to provide directions what does it tell you it means these laws whatever provisions are there in the indian penal code are not implemented executed properly that is the reason or do you think that direction given the supreme court is something called judicial activism or judicial overreach because i am saying there are legal provisions in ipc what are they section 153a section 153b section 295a section 298 section 505 have you come across this section anywhere this is not important 298 leave this have you come across this 153a 153b 295a this is something always in the news 295a this is india's blasphemy law blasphemy you know blasphemy blasphemous speech a speech ha huh, bolo sir i speak against any particular religion against defending any particular religion 
a speech against any particular religion if not blasphemy defaming see the problem is not defaming section 95a clearly says i'll define it for you i'll tell you a speech which insults religion or religious belief of citizen but the speech should be premeditated premeditated and should have malicious intent it is very much necessary to understand criticism of any political ideology any economic program of any government or any religion or religious figure is not neither hate speech or nor what we say this <clears throat> blasphemy hate speech is not equivalent to criticism always keep in mind we are debating hate speech in the context of free speech i have told you why this definition is not been legalized because free speech is very important the debate has to be contextualized in the background of free speech freedom of speech and expression article 191a in order to curb prosecute hate speech we should not take any such measures which lead to unreasonable restriction on freedom of speech don't you think so i'll come to that but this has to be kept in mind why is it so again so 295a something always in the news because this is misused by administration and the police especially the police and the political executive to prosecute to harass who comedians critic of the government religious criticism can you recall some personality here can you recall some personality which means who ha huh. sorry ha ah, mohammad subair yes theek hai aur you can add dupur sharma here also dupur sharma mohammad subair perumal murugan you know perumal murugan anyway perumal murugan is a of a tamil author who wrote a book which some religious sect or group felt that is against their religious uh, conviction or belief so he has been uh, prosecuted trying to you know the state has taken some action against him etc etc most of the time 295a has been employed by the state not to prevent hate speech but to prevent legitimate criticism and defend of people keep in mind section 295a is only dealing with religion in the sense that speech which is insulting to religious belief or religion will attract the charge under 295 if the speech is premeditated and malicious intent this is important premeditated malicious intent but this 295 is necessary to address the problem of hate speech too but rather than using 295a for addressing the problem of hate speech against particular religion it is being used to sh shut out legitimate criticism or legitimate opinion and freedom of speech and expression of the press media and other people 153a 153a deals with what speech promoting enmity speech promoting enmity between group of people based on 
religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth, etc. Enmity between group of people. So, when a person is, let's say, using hateful language, right? so do you think that it is going to create some kind of hatred or let's say uh, enmity or discrimination? <clears throat> this is dealing with enmity between group. I am saying that People belonging to this particular community are not true Indians. So what are I trying to do? I am trying to pit the people belonging to this community and others. I am trying to create enmity between them. I am saying that people who are speaking this language are not patriots. And this language is not important, that language, they should learn this language. I am saying people who belong to this particular region are not Indian. They should be having second class citizenship. Do you record something in COVID-19 times when people belonging to the Northeast region have been accused of carriers of Corona? Because Corona, generally it is thought that origin is China. Northeast people, they say that they resemble characteristic race so they have been accused of even physically attacked in Delhi. Not only that discriminated, no home is given, house is given. So don't you think that enmity? So the point again is this. This is dealing with assertion prejudicial to national integration. Assertion prejudicial to national integration, which is similar to this. Assertion, which means statement. National integration. National integration. I published an article saying that the people belonging to particular this re particular region, <coughs> they eat this particular particular animal which is holy to us what am i trying to do or let's say <clears throat> i am saying that people of particular this caste people belonging to this caste should not be given full citizenship right then what i'm trying to say i'm trying to create divide between them what is the meaning of national integration here Territorial as well as psychological. Ultimately, we are all Indians. When the speech is trying to divide, discriminate, and pit one group against the another, then integration is impacted. Fraternity is impacted. Ultimately, without any without fraternity, the brotherhood, there cannot be any integration. You might have territorial. Integration, the term unity and integrity in the preamble signifies what? Not only territorial. You might have territorial integrity. Your borders are secured. But what about psychological integration? The oneness. We are all Indians. That idea. When you create division in society, when you create hatred among people, then this oneness, this fraternity, brotherhood, everything is what? Impacted. So these provisions, 153b, again, one, this 505, this deals with publication. Publication leading to um, enmity between classes or let's say divisions. This deals with publication, which means a book, social media, anything. This is important to know because this is dealing with classes. I will give an example to explain this. In Maharashtra, in Maharashtra, uh, one newspaper 
was prosecuted or cases were charged against one newspaper for reporting that within the government departments there is no cohesion coordination there, there is differences strong differences serious divergence of opinion between police department and the crime branch i mean the general police and the crime branch so the police charged this newspaper for under 505 why it is creating division between classes the police as a class and the other police as a class you must might be thinking that there is serious overlapping here it's a fact that so many things overlap here it is very difficult to what difficult to categorize what offense falls under what that is why whenever a person is charged under 295a you will see that person is also charged under 153a and extra etc etc there is huge overlapping but the point i am trying to say that these provisions are sufficient won't won't is sufficient these provisions are there in the law which should be utilized by the police and administration for tackling hate speech however these laws are not being used to tackle hate speech but to shut out or stop or prevent legitimate criticism instead of promoting uh, preventing hate speech it is preventing free speech if i am able to put it correctly these are necessary for various aspects yes but their purpose is not to prevent free speech but to prevent hate speech but these laws are used in such a way that they they prevent free speech some examples i have given i have given you here these laws are there for almost 70 years but ncrb national crime record bureau it has studied various aspect of hate speech it came out with a report it says in 2014 the number of hate speeches right i mean let's say the cases registered as per in 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 this let's say uh, section it's around 300 kitna tha 320 yes around 320 320 in 2014 now in 2020 it is around 1800 National Crime Records Bureau is saying this. 2014, it na 320 around. Now it is 800. 2020. This is only registered cases. And you know that in India, cases are not registered very easily. So the point is that hate speech is something which is, despite this legal system we have, hate speech is something which is. tearing the fabric of of society recently we have seen hate speeches in where dharam sansad report also shows the all reports about cases like government and it is you are saying that this is over reporting now i want to ask you one thing what is your idea about registration of fir generally the police is not willing to register in fir the reason why the supreme court had to step in and pro provide direction to police to register so much fir why because generally fir also not registered police is not willing to register fir and take action the case in which the supreme court has given direction you know that there was an earlier case tahseen punawala versus union of india 2018 kya hai tahseen tahseen Pune wala versus Union of India 2018, in which the Supreme Court has given direction, Pan India direction to curb mob lynching and speeches which incite people for mob lynching. This has not been complied with. Contempt petition against the administration has been filed in the Supreme Court. Recently, Haridwar, Delhi. In Haridwar, people said, "What? 
there will be 1857 like revolution against whom you know that against whom criticized not criticized <clears throat> accused the political the political class the administration the judges everybody for helping one particular community one person has said one particular group of people should go to the houses of another group of people and commit rape one said fleet throat one said in delhi economic boycott during corona do you know corona jihad something happened The number of hate speech incidents in this country are increasing. It does not show anything about over-reporting. There is no question of over-reporting. It is under-reporting. Because you are saying, <clears throat> we are simply saying data, 320 and 2020, I mean 1800. If it is over-reporting, then the government, NCRB is a government agency. It should be very much careful about that. It is not the case. You correlate this with this. You correlate the number of conviction under this. The registration of FIR is from beginning. What happens after that? Hate speech has become prevalent in this country. Across communities, across group of people. And this is not only impacting individuals, not only impacting the group of people, but the country per se. How it is impacting the country? Law and order, fine. It undermines the very idea of this country. Country or nation is made up of people. Yes, unity and diversity, is the credo of this country. And without oneness, without unity and integrity, country cannot pro progress. It has ramification, not only the territorial integrity is also under threat. See, when you are creating dissension among people, one group of people will know that, yes, see, this is not our country. We want to secede, separatism, secession. The country is still developing. The country has multiple amount of problems. Do you think that when the country is divided, can we meet these challenges? We are fighting something called two and half front war. Two matlab? Pakistan one side, China one side, and what is half? Internal security. Without the people being together, can we able to challenge, meet the challenges of national security? Can we meet the challenges of economic security? The constitution of India says that India is what? Secular. Secularism is one of the basic structure of constitution. Do you think that when people are divided, there is fraternity? Fraternity assuring the dignity of individual and unity and integrity of nation. Preamble. You see this linkage. Without fraternity, there cannot be any unity. There cannot be integration. Hate speech undermines, attacks fraternity. Individual level, collective level, and the country as a whole. It is not necessary that hate speech will lead to violence. That is the crucial distinction between sedition and hate speech. Hate speech, inciting hatred, hatred. That is inciting to violence, incitement to violence. Hate speech need not lead to violence. Hate speech can lead to social boycott. Hate speech can lead to undermining my dignity, my personhood. Hate speech can lead to my full participation in political process.
hate speech will create psychological trauma hate speech will impact governance it has huge ramifications the fundamental strength of this country is unity and diversity when india was formed in 1947 western scholars said that this country is having so much diversity and it is not possible for this country to stand for more than two decades this country will disintegrate the prognosis even by churchill we have defied the prognosis because our underlying public policy or governance everything is based upon the idea of unity and diversity we pro promote diversity sabka saath sabka vikas sabka vishwas and sabka prayas this is what prime minister says do you think that sabka is possible here when community is fighting against community when people are fighting against people when language is being imposed upon one group of people people food habits are not tolerated so it is in this in this context that people have approached the supreme court recently incidents have happened in delhi uttar uttarakhand and uttar pradesh despite supreme court asking for clarification status report etc etc it seems that nothing have been done so people went to supreme court supreme court had to step in and provide guidelines not guidelines binding direction what are they which have, which we have which we have uh, provided that something again i will tell you briefly do not wait for complaint whenever there is hate speech so more to take action and if you do not take action then you will be liable for contempt of court which means police will be hold up not only that the dgp and higher police officers have to instruct or forward this message of supreme court to subordinate level because in police station it is the circle inspector sho or the sub inspector they should be very well aware of the developments it is not the superintendent of police or the dgp who is going to register fir who is going to take action it is the policeman on the ground who should be made aware of it so this message has to the communication should be passed through down the hierarchy <clears throat> supreme court said there are sufficient provisions in the law which are they 153 a b and etc use them to curb hate speech and provide a status report the reason supreme court had to intervene is lack of lack of what lack of actions by administration lack of action by administration and the police do you think that supreme court should intervene or should not intervene no sir it should intervene sir why, why should supreme court intervene because because sir ha ah, tell me executive executive is not taking action and law and order is also the prerogative of the supreme court law and order is not the prerogative of supreme court supreme court is the guardian of the constitution protector of the fundamental rights for people right so <clears throat> it can step in this is a writ petition you, you are talking about this case yes. in this case the case name is uh, shaheen abdullah shaheen abdullah versus union of india that is the case name it's a writ petition right it is not necessary that whenever there is a writ petition which is going to supreme court or pl is filed in the supreme court the supreme court has to step in there are many pals which have been filed in supreme court recently challenging let's say one one i will tell you challenging the appointment of whom chief justice of india a pl was uh, uh, pl was filed to ascertain the true character of taj mahal so it is not necessary that supreme court should step in the primary organ for grievance redressal primary organ for governance 
policy making and implementation is non judicial organs legislative and executive and administration not the supreme court but the indian constitution provides a very different position to the supreme court because they are constitutional court they have the power of judicial review they are the guardian of constitution they interpret the constitution an indian parliamentary system is based upon what checks and balances so whenever the other organs do not function properly the supreme court can enter and or can provide some guideline or some binding direction they have done right so it is not wrong that this is not a case of judicial activism because supreme court is laying down direction what is doing it is laying down policy administration should function this way this is what it is doing but this what it is doing is necessary in the context of larger constitutional scheme of things so it is not something judicial activism or overreach but the point is this is not the first time that issues related to hate speech went to supreme court this is not the first time hate speech jurisprudence this is not the first time supreme court has dealt with this we have provided some cases in the booklet you can see that but one important thing i have to tell you is this in none of the judgments supreme court have defined hate speech right from 1957 to 1960 to 1989 to 2014 2020 22 no definition in 2014 pravasi bhalai sangathan pravasi bhalai sangathan supreme court requested law commission of india you know that law commission 267 report it requested law commission of india to look into the matter of hate speech and provide a workable definition law commission provided but not be incorporated in the statute book law commission also said in order to address hate speech these provisions are not sufficient we should define hate speech we should have a different set of law it said add 153c in ipc 153 c not added 505 a you amend the ipc and 153c and 505a and it said speech which incites hatred alarm fear and violence can be categorized as hate speech and it has provided minimum punishment and maximum punishment but this has not been incorporated now the point i am saying why supreme court has not defined this as to rush why supreme court has not defined and why the legislature was unwilling still unwilling to define hate speech to understand that we should know the know the what debate between hate speech and free speech ultimately hate speech is a speech right so there is something called freedom of speech and expression do you recall one judgment of supreme court freya singhal freya singhal judgment dealing with 66 a 2015 it act supreme court struck down 66 a because some wording language of 66 a are not properly defined vague overboard nebulous and they are not as per the reasonable restriction under 191 sorry 192 you know that article 191a provides what freedom of speech and expression 
Article 19.1a is hedged, which means restricted by 19.2, reasonable restriction. Pata hai na? So reasonable restriction based upon what? On reasonable restriction on the ground of sovereignty, integrity, security of state, public health, morality. Public health, morality. Public health hai. Morality hai. Public health hai. Public health, my health is not. Freedom of speech and expression. I am saying freedom of speech and expression, not freedom of movement. Defamation, incitement to offence, public order, morality are there. On the basis of that, state can make law to restrict freedom of speech and expression. Hate speech is not a ground there. But again, let's take public order. Do you think that whenever there is a hate speech, there can be some problem of, let's say, public disorder? A person who is known to promote hate speech. And he wants to give a lecture or a speech in one particular area. The district administration denied permission. Why? The district administration said, we are denying permission for this person because he is known to give hateful speech and after the speech, there have been incidents where there have been public disorder, violence. So, in order to prevent that, we are denying permission. Praveen Togadia, 1990, I think the year I am not able to recall. There is a case which we have provided. Praveen Togadia, in Praveen Togadia case, the district administration denied permission to Praveen Togadia, saying that he has a history of hate speech and there is a problem of violence after this, so we deny it. Public order can be a ground to deny free speech. But in Shreya Singhal Supreme Court said, whatever word you are using, offensive, <coughs> some words have been used here which are so vague, opening to multiple interpretation, and which fall which do not satisfy the requirement under Article 19.2. Because the requirement under Article 19.2 is reasonable. The restrictions which are putting under 66A are not reasonable, it violates freedom of speech and expression. This Sriya Singhal judgment has set a very broad conduct of restrictions. Not only that, there is something called Puttasami judgment. Puttasami judgment, 2017. Right to privacy judgment. In that it said, restriction should be reasonable. And the reasonability of restriction will be judged under doctrine of proportionality. Proportionality doctrine. Doctrine of proportionality. Which have four pillars again. Time will not permit for me to explain this. Right, whenever time comes, I'll do that. So, the bar of restriction the bar of restriction on free speech is very high. So whatever definition you make, whatever restriction you make should fulfill the, the reasonability criteria. See, when you define hate speech, I have provided you two definitions of hate speech, Law Commission and Black's Law Dictionary. The way all of you interpret this definition might be different. Because subjectivity is entrenched here. Something you might feel hateful, I might not feel. Incitement to hatred, what exactly it means? The point I'm trying to say, anything which is being used as restriction on free speech, or fundamental right should satisfy some criteria. It cannot be broadly defined. When there is broadly, when there is broad definition, when there is vague nature of terms, it provides opportunity for who? The police and administration to misuse it. You recall sedition. Sedition? Section 124A. When you read section 124A, what is the impression you are getting? The section is framed in such a way that it is open to multiple interpretation. 
whoever incites of a disaffection hatred ill will what does it mean keep this in mind most of the ipc crpc is a colonial origin the reason for these laws are not betterment of indian people but for efficiency of the administration indian administration indian political system changed from one being control oriented to service oriented so rights of constitution gave rights to people so whenever those rights are taken away restricted it should be reasonable it should be limited the constitutional norms are rights for people restrictions are exceptions whenever there is a definition whenever there is a legal enactment of hate speech it should satisfy the criteria of free speech that is one of the reason why this definition is not what we say the court has not given any definition neither the legislature has not come out, out with but supreme court sorry recently there is a committee set up by the union government committee on criminal justice reform bajpai committee which committee bajpai gs bajpai mm no it is not gs bajpai mm. ranveer singh committee yes ranveer singh gs bajpai is a member in that ranveer singh i think a former vice chancellor or current vice chancellor of uh, nalfa delhi or uh, i think it's not nalfa nlu delhi uh, what are that might be a committee of criminal justice reform have been set up it is been tasked with addressing the problem of hate speech providing a definition legal changes etc etc the point we are saying in our quest or attempt to prevent hate speech punish hate speech we should not make the free speech casualty in usa free speech is almost absolute there is no restriction first amendment of us constitution provides free speech absolute free speech somebody has said freedom to speech is free no it is like you have a freedom of speech your freedom of speech but i cannot guarantee your freedom after the speech this is not the condition in usa absolute free speech because it says let it let ideas flow let information conduct in the market marketplace today tomorrow truth will come out yes The, uh, when we are saying absolute, this reasonable restrictions are not there. The constitution is not. There. No, no, no. But they have methods to tackle. Definitely, yes, yes. There are other provisions, but First Amendment provides what we call because see, constitution has to be read together. The way it is there in Western countries, the way it is there in India and other democracies, it is. the the, uh, the uh, freedom of speech is very high in usa i am not saying there are no restrictions but it is very up, almost absolute in indian constitution there are so many grounds under which it can be restricted but usa even if there are some grounds it is very less it is relatively very high it is near absolute that should be the uh, correct way near absolute free speech because they according to them see that is the reason why this hate speech is something which is a big issue in usa too Do you remember trump the problem with free speech is that it can tend to distort truth but american society or american constitution the american evolution the history is like that near absolute free speech is there but it does not prevent you from to prevent the state from prosecuting you there won't be any self censorship here i know there are so many grounds i know that i will restrict my speech one of the reason free speech is near absolute in usa 
the uh, one of the reason USA has been so developed. So many ideas are coming out from USA. Economy, polity, science, everything. Why? And why people are going there? Society is free. The problem is that, that's true, I'm not saying it is not the case, but in general, if that is the case, US, most Western countries talk about human rights, freedom, democracy, but they are the most, uh, they are the countries which have abused these things, because the, these are the groups of countries which colonize the people. Ultimately, it is the national interest. See, yeah, you are talking about McCarthyism. There is the, John McCarthy was the senator of USA. So he is known for this suppressing of communism. It was, happened in early 50s, 1950, Cold War. Right? That's a different issue. But as far as citizenship rights are concerned, near absolute speech. But in India, the constitution provides limitation. In the UK, Human Rights Act. 2008. In Australia, Criminal Amendment Act 2018, Digital Market Strategy, European Union. So when you see various other countries, they have laws to deal with hate speech. But those laws, but those provisions are defined in such a narrow manner. Perfect definition, I must say. So that it will not impact what we say, free speech. In Canada, there is a case in Canada. I will take five more minutes. After that, I will go to ne next topic. Canada versus Taylor, 1990. In this case, citizen, one citizen approached Canadian Supreme Court, saying that the restriction on free speech is unconstitutional. Because Canada, the constitution, sorry, the, 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 the laws, but it penalized hate speech. So he said this penalization is against the constitutional freedom of speech, speech and expression. The court rejected this contention. It says hate speech and propaganda serves no purpose. It does not help the citizen to understand the truth. It does not help in an increasing engagement of people. It does not help to unravel truth. It does not help in promoting fraternity. Only thing hate speech does is to create division in society, to promote hatred against people. So hate speech serves no purpose. Recall the what? The definition of black flow dictionary. A speech which has no meaning, but to create or uh, incite hatred against people. Now the question is, in Indian context, we see a lot of problems of hate speech. And we understand the impact of hate speech. The Supreme Court has been approached multiple times, including the current case. Still, we do not have any proper legal system or way to understand what is hate speech and what is free speech. In fact, what is hate speech, what is not hate speech? What is free and what is hateful? We should have some kind of framework to understand it. It will help the court also to judge on a case to case basis what is hateful and what is not hateful. Now, I'm going to discuss one important judgment of the Supreme Court, which has provided a yardstick or let's say a framework or a test. This is very important because this provides a proper understanding to us how to approach hate speech, how to tackle hate speech. You remember this, Amish Devgan, Amish Devgan versus Union of India. 2020. Remember this case?
Amish Devigan is a journalist in a news channel. When he was conducting a debate on one particular issue, he called, he used derogatory language against Khwaja Moinudun Chishti. You know Khwaja Moinudun Chishti? Sufi? Yes. Now, some people felt that this is hateful speech, this is violating the provisions under 295, etc., etc. They, <clears throat> in many states, FIRs have been referred against Amish Devgan. Many states. Amish Devgan approached the Supreme Court that quash the FIR, club the FIR, etc., etc. Our purpose is that Supreme Court, while pronouncing this judgment, provided a technique, a method, a framework to distinguish between free speech and good speech. What are they? In order to identify hate speech from non-hateful speech, some elements are required. Some uh, elements, some features need to be clearly understood. One, context of speech. This is not provided in the booklet. Context of the speech, content of the speech, context, content, intent of the speech, impact of the speech. So, a speech, whether it is hateful or not, has to be determined, adjudged based upon this. Context, who's making the speech, where the speech is made. What is the occasion? Etc. etc. I'll, I'll take an example and I'll explain it. Don't worry. Content. Content means words, phrases, etc. Which by using the objective standard society are offensive. Objectively offensive. See, when you are writing an answer, you simply write this. Supreme Court in Amish Devigan has provided a framework or a matrix to distinguish between hate speech and free speech. Context, context, interest, impact, and I will tell you a few more. That's it. Don't have to explain these things. I am telling you not to, so that you understand things, right? Again, intent. Intent. The intent is to incite hatred. That is, no legitimate purpose. The only purpose of the in purpose of the speech is to hatred, violence, etc. That is it. Impact. What is the impact of the speech on the person whom it is targeted against? Impact kya hai? Psychological, stress, trauma, violence, discrimination, boycott, etc. etc. Anything can be impact. Now the major problem might be here, impact. As I mentioned, the way people react to something is subjective. There are people who are easily, there are people who are emotional, sensitive. They will react to everything. They will not take any criticism, any critical comment. So they are not tolerant. The point is that, how will you, because, because the impact might be different on different group of people, how will you know that whether it is hateful or not? Supreme Court says, the impact of a speech has to be judged on the test of reasonable man. There is a test called reasonable man test. Kya hai? Reasonable man test. Reasonable man. Reasonable man. It can be woman too, not an issue. Reasonable person. Anyway. But the, the, the exact the technical name is reasonable man test. Reasonable man. A man who is stronger. A man who is educated. <clears throat> who is defendable. Who is mature. And not a man who sends danger at every occasion. Who is highly emotional. We are simply saying, this impact needs to be judged on the basis of reasonable man test. 
reasonable man how a reasonable man or reasonable woman react to something the reasonable means reason logic education for a reasonable man for the bar of judging a speech which is hateful or not should be based upon reasonable man test there are many people in this country who are easily offended right because whenever something is said something is written they start protesting there are many protests in this country against many movies jodha akbar one there are many protests against many books there are many protests against comedian cancelling shows etc etc so on the drop of a hat they they get offended and if you judge their speech on their standard then every speech will be hateful then it will be impact free speech so the impact of a speech should be judged on the standard of a reasonable man this will help protection of free speech a speech which is given in good faith and having legitimate purpose is protected i am writing a book in which i have highlighted the atrocities committed by one ruler the book is uh, <clears throat> written to help the student to study or let's say the book is <clears throat> for uh, book is recommended to f uh, course in university so what is my purpose my purpose is academic research oriented not to create hatred so whenever even see i am saying there are many books many speeches many addresses many movies etc the purpose is to educate people it is done in good faith not to create dissension among society so those speeches those those works should be, should be protected and in order to protect that we should use this reasonable man test unfortunately most of the abuses of law in the ipsc i just mentioned the laws are used because the administration is not following this the question is the administration does not know see how many of you know about this i mean now you know but before this lecture have you ever come across of this content intent test reasonable man etc yes or no no do you think that people who fitting in the police station they will be knowing this you know that freya singer 2015 struck down 66a recently the supreme court has to direct the union of government union of india to <clears throat> ask the states and the police from registering fir under 66a still people are what charged under 66a 15 may band kar diya tha 22 still people are being charged so do you think that this test or this this everything will be in their mind but as per academic purpose as far as our examination is concerned you can say although there are no water right compartment water right definition of a hate speech whether internationally there is no international accepted accepted definition because un does not provide one as such but it does not mean that actions have not been taken against hate speech even in india too neither the court nor the legislature has so far provided any definition or any specific law to deal with hate speech because there is no specific law to deal with hate speech supreme court has to come come with direction to fill the vacuum so whenever there is a vacuum of law supreme court can step and fill in vishaka guideline example sexual harassment no law to specifically deal with it supreme court lay down guideline our the heading of our topic is this supreme court laying down guideline to fill the vacuum of law vacuum of law vacuum of policy supreme court can step in but that should not be what frequent if it is frequent then it lead to encroachment overreach ultimately the 
constitution provides various power authority mechanism machineries to the government of the day to carry out administration not to the court but having said that supreme court has a very important role as far as, far as our constitution is concerned so it is mandated to do that otherwise there won't be any purpose of 32 article 32 or article 142 one example i can give you 30 years Perari Valen plus other people. State government has recommended release them. Governor did not act. Kept on it. Supreme Court has used 142. The reason why these powers is given the constitution, it has a reason. It should be used. Otherwise, it will become what? Dead letter. So whenever directions are given, it 142 is something which is used. Anyway. The point I am saying, this is an academic, uh, not academic, let's say, this is a matrix, content, sorry, context, who is making? Let's say, high ranking politician is making, which will have more ramification. So responsibility should be there with the person who is making the speech. Content, right, over the words, phrases, etc. The society in India do not accept some kind of words, you know that. Let's say some abusive language. Socially, it is not acceptable. Cutting across community and region. So when it is being used, then it is offensive. Or it is trying to infect hatred. Intent. Only purpose is to sow dissension in society. You know something called Radio Rwanda. Have you heard about this? Radio Rwanda. Radio Rwanda. Radio channel in Rwanda, Africa. Have you heard about Rwandan genocide, Tutsi and Hutsi? This radio channel kept on transmitting, broadcasting hate against one particular community. It reached to a level that one community took up arms and millions of other tribes are killed. Unfortunately, in Indian system, the media in India, especially the social media and the, some news channels in this country are using the same thing. But the point I'm saying, trying to say, it is necessary to control hate speech. There have been so many instances. One news channel who used the term UPC Jihad. Remember UPC Jihad? Huh. So, <laughs> I don't know. The point I'm trying to say, media is one of the major root cause of hate speech. Especially, one particular language media. I am not saying which language. <clears throat> the debate between hate speech and free speech is there. But that does not mean that hate speech should not be controlled, prevented or punished. It is necessary that government of India or the uh, legislature come out with a legal uh, system to deal with hate speech. But those system, those laws should not be unreasonable restriction of free speech. It should be narrowly defined, purposefully defined, objectively constructed, so as to only address the problem of hate speech. And the, by the time the, the law does not materialize, the administration and the police should take action, irrespective of religious identity of people, irrespective of political affiliation. Not only that, we as a people also have responsibility. Ultimately, hate speech, hate, speech, hate speech does not occur in vacuum. No, only one institution is not responsible for it. There is a social climate of acceptance. Why is it so? Because people are quiet. The civil society is not functioning properly. The government is not taking, taking action properly. So, multi-pronged approach is required. Legal, institutional, political, social. And media should adhere to ethics. There is a program code under Cable TV Network Regulation Act. Program code. Which tells 
that the news channel should adhere to this program code. If there is violation, then you can complain to interministerial committee. Recently, IT Act ha has been amended, not IT Act, IT rules have been promulgated by the government of India, which sets up grievance redressal committee and uh, interministerial committee, ministerial committee of the uh, apex level. So people like you and me and people who are concerned should use this me mechanism. Criminal Justice Reform Committee has been tasked with this, right? Renewal Singh Committee, the, we hope that committee will come out with recommendation and after that, problem hate speech will be addressed. Multi-pronged approach to address the problem of hate speech is required, cutting across legal, institutional, social and other domains. The primary responsibility of addressing hate speech lies with the police at this point in time. Though law must be used for its objective purpose rather than preventing hate speech. International examples can also be taken. For that, we can reform our system. Okay? Six. Next topic. Pressure of governor. Pressure of governor, which means Recently, recently, Ker the governor of Kerala has written a letter to the chief minister of Kerala. In that letter, he said, I am withdrawing my, my pressure with respect to one minister and you take appropriate action. The chief minister said, the prerogative is mine to appoint or dismiss a minister as per the constituent scheme of things, not the governor. The question is the pressure given in the constitution, whether it is individual pressure of the governor or there is something beyond that. What exactly is the meaning of pressure in constitution? Whether pressure is the pressure of the governor or pressure of the legislature, whether it is private pressure or constitutional pressure. Governor is an entity which is who is always in news. We have discussed something called governess as chancellors earlier. Governess as chancellors, university. So this is something related to this, but this is a different, uh, different in the sense that a different conceptual area. Pleasure. Various articles in the constitution provides the power of pleasure to the governor and the president. I will take five minutes to give you, a, uh, give you an overview of pleasure in constitution. Doctrine of pleasure. Union level. State level. President. Governor. Political, administrative, political, administrative. At the union level, Article 75 provides that ministers hold office during the pressure of the president. 75, 74 is aid and uh, advice. Okay. Article 75 says, Council of Ministers hold office during the pleasure of the president. Find them. Achhi baat hai. Article 310 says, the servants of the union government. Holds office during the pressure of the president. So, political means councillor ministers, individual minister, councillor minister, cabinet, dealt with 75. Administrative 310. A civil servant and a defense service personnel. 
civil defense. They hold office during the pressure of the president, which means the president can remove these people. Although there are some condition, etc. But again, but in general, they can remove. They can remove it by president. Similarly, political governor, ministers at the state level hold office during the pressure of the governor. Article 164. Administrative 310. Because state level people do, hey, both sorry. State level civil servants appointed by the state government hold office during the pressure of governor. <clears throat> so this is the overview of pleasure, both political and administrative. Now our focus of discussion is 164. Governors, pleasure, and council of ministers at the state level. The meaning of pleasure is power to act independently for uh, no. Power to terminate. Power to terminate the services of an individual. What is the literal meaning of pleasure? Satisfaction. Again, and after that. I will have full control over you. Your work will be controlled by me. You will have no rights. You are doing some job or you are, I am employing you as long as I feel I should, I should employ you. If I feel that, if I decide that you are no longer required, I do not want your service, then you are gone. No security of tenure. No security of tenure. So, doctrine of pleasure is antithetical to security of tenure. When there is pleasure, then there is no security. When there is no security, the individual holding the office will not function properly. The individual holding the office will function as per the dictates, orders, direction of the appointing authority. Governor also holds office during the pressure of the president. Don't you think so? Governor holds office during the pressure of the president. That is one of the reason that governor is in the thick of things. But yeah, our discussion will be based upon this governor's pleasure with respect to state. Although this can be uh, what we say, this can be used in the larger issue of pleasure with respect to politics, not administration. That's a different area, right? So power to power to terminate, which means. Article 154 says, Council of Ministers hold office during the pressure of the governor. Does it mean that governor has the power to terminate a council of minister? Does the pressure in the 154 mean the individual pressure of the governor? Or something else, constitutional or legislative? Can the governor withdraw pleasure or terminate the service of a minister? Can the governor independently sack a minister? That is what we are going to see. Our understanding or the Indian constitutional scheme, the way it functions, president and governor, governors are formal head, constitutional head. Although constitution, the language of constitution, if you read, that it seems that every power is within the president and the governor. Right? But it is the opposite. Because it is a way of representing. Because India followed parliamentary system of government from where? There, something called West Minister system. West mi Minister, not Minister. West Minister. 
the place where British Parliament is situated. Right? So under the system, in Britain too, it is the monarch, is formal head, parliamentary supreme. Because we followed the structure of governance as far as parliamentary system, as minister, we followed these uh, so many provisions, including this pleasure. In Britain, do you think that the monarchy is sovereign or the parliament is sovereign? Parliament is sovereign because the monarchy is constitutional monarch. Before, let's say, the parliamentary sovereignty, the monarch was absolute. Let's say, we can say, before 1256, Magna Carta. And after that, before that, he was supreme. So the doctor of pleasure, at that point in time, the monarch was absolute, the king was absolute. His servants, whether it is political or administrative, who held office during the pressure of the uh, this monarch, sovereign. So because he was powerful, ultimate. Every people worked on behalf of him, worked for him. They were servants. So who is the master here? The monarch. So master can terminate the service of servant. But during the evolution of the constitution, this sovereignty shifted from monarch to parliament. Democracy, rule of law, constitutionalism, everything came to occupy central place. So this pleasure has been diluted. Pleasure, although this doctrine is retained, but it is not actually the pressure of governor, sorry, this monarch. It is the pressure of the government of the day and the parliament. That is something India adopted in our constitution. Recall what Ambedkar said. The president and governor have no functions under the constitution. They have some duties to perform. They cannot act independently of the Council of Ministers. They cannot act against the advice of Council of Ministers. When the doctrine of pleasure was, discussing, was discussed in the Constitutional Assembly, Ambedkar said, we have simply borrowed the pleasure doctrine from the Westminster system. There is no other meaning to it. It has no other usage. It means, if you look at the Constitutional Assembly debate, if you look at the uh, Indian system of governance, parliamentary system, the pleasure is not actually governance, individual pleasure. Now the question is, whose pleasure is that? In order to answer that question, we should also know something called collective responsibility. Question is, whose pressure? Whose, pl whose pleasure? Kiska pleasure hai? Which means, council minister hold office during the pressure of the governor. We are saying it is not actually independent pressure of the governor or individualistic or private pressure of the governor. But whose pressure then? It is, we are dealing with state, fine. CM's pleasure, number one. Second is legislative pressure. Why CM's pleasure? The chief minister is appointed by the governor. And other ministries are appointed by who? By the governor with the recommendation of chief, chief minister. If chief ministers can recommend your appointment, the chief minister is, chief minister can also recommend your removal. And not only that, India follows something called parliamentary system of government, government, cabinet system, PM, for the CM is the head at the state level. If CM resigns, what will happen? Devolves. If CM dies, what will happen? Goes. So CM is the, at the head of the council of ministers. So parliamentary conventions dictate that the CM is at the head of the council of ministers. And it is his prerogative to appoint or remove a minister. Individual level minister. Now what about this legislative? Ministers are collective responsible to 
what legislature in the in the uh, union level lok sabha if a state having two houses assembly so assembly which means legislature will have pleasure of the council of ministers as long as as long as the council of ministers enjoy majority at the house it's a very technical area you need to be very careful here you know because lot of things have to be linked together then only we'll get a clear idea i am saying pleasure if not the individual level of government at the uh, private pressure of governor sorry governor i have provided two justification for that constitutional assembly debate i provided ambedkar word i have provided ambedkar ne kya kaha theek hai then i said indian parliamentary system westminster level we adopted there are few more that i'll come later but the point i'm trying to say that it is not governor's pleasure then whose pleasure i am saying it is cm pleasure because cm is the recommendatory authority to the governor to appoint a minister and not only that when cm resigns or dies then the council member goes so parliamentary convention the way parliamentary system functions is this cm or the pm at the union level is powerful and according to that according to him or as per his wishes or requirement council members are appointed if that is not the case then there is no need for mentioning that what mentioning other ministers are appointed by the recommendation of the chief minister of or prime minister now the question is fine but what about the entire council of ministers we know that council of ministers come from legislature council of ministers hold office as long as they enjoy majority in the house the legislature by passing no confidence motion can remove the council of ministers the way the passing of no confidence motion is a mechanism of displaying lack of pleasure when you are saying that your uh, the legislature is passing no confidence motion and it is passed what is the impact of that in general council minister council ministers are <coughs> dismissed or let's say a, a, another ministry comes they vacate office their services are terminated so don't you think that by passing no confidence motion the legislature is expressing lack of pleasure lack of confidence legislature is terminating the services of council ministers so pleasure operates at two level individual collective individual level ministers it is what chief minister removal and appointment legislature collective no confidence motion <clears throat> while dealing with the pressure of the governor one specific case went to went to supreme court well i will tell you one more case shamsher singh was a state of punjab 19 uh, i'm chasing state of punjab 1970s shamsher singh sham shamsher very important case shamsher singh versus state of punjab in this case the supreme court said the president and the governors are formal head under the constitution all their powers should be exercised as per the aid and advice of the council of ministers except in specific circumstances and what are the specific circumstances i will tell you this is 1974 i think this judgment some provision of judgment has been incorporated under 42nd amendment act because 74 was amended in through 42nd right anyway so this has settled the matter governor or president they are formal head they have to 
act as per the aid and advice of the who? Council, council ministers, except in some circumstances. What are they? I'm going to tell you that. <clears throat> Another case, 1969, specific dealing with doctrine of pleasure. Hmm. Ram Prasad versus Farfulla Chandra. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Mahavir Prasad. Mahavir Prasad versus Prafulla Chandra 1969. Supreme Court said the pleasure of the governor is not his individual pleasure. The pleasure should be read with 1642. 1641 should be read with 1642. What is 1641? Do you have a confusion with you? Ye hai, nahi hai, shodo. 1641 says, Council Ministers hold office during the pressure of the Governor. 1642 says, Council Ministers are collecting responsible to the legislature. It should be read together. If you read together, what will happen? It means, the pressure is actually belonging to who? The legislature. Collectivity. Collective pressure. So it is not the governor who can dismiss the council of ministers or remove governor. Sorry, remove the minister. It is the legislature. By looking at the debate of the constitution, the way Indian system functions, Supreme Court judgment, we come to the conclusion that it is not the individual pressure of the governor. Doctrine of pressure, as far as the political level is concerned, not the individualistic pressure of governor. Whose pressure? It is CM's pleasure or the legislative pleasure. But does that mean that gov the governor cannot act independently? Are there any occasions, circumstances in which the governor can act without the aid and advice of the council ministers? In all its function, the governor has to abide by the aid and advice of who? Council ministers, under Article 163. But it is provided, some discretion is provided to the governor. Now the question is, on the basis of discretion, can the governor dismiss or terminate the service of ministers? Article 163 provides discretion to governor. On, by using the discretion, can the governor terminate the service of minister? No, sir. Why? Because it's, a it's, a, it's in the hand of the parliament, parliament or state legislature. But are there any conditions given under Article 163, which defines the discretionary power of governor? Article 163 provides discretion to governor. Termination of termination of a minister is an executive function of governor. But in all his executive function, he must act as per the aid and advice of the council of minister. But Article 163 also provides discretion to governor. So for what purpose the discretion is given? And under what circumstances the discretion can be used? Can the discretion be used to terminate the service of the minister? The answer is no. Because the discretion given in Article 163 is very clear in the sense that it is related to those areas in which the constituent specifically provides discretion. I'll give you some example. You know that there are some special provisions in Article 371 dealing with uh, the low internal situation in Northeast India in which the governor can act independently. Article 356 of the constitution. Do you think that can, will the council minister will recommend preferential rule to the governor? So the, when recommending 356 to the president or union government, he can act as per discretion. 
He can sanction the sanction the uh, prosecution of a minister under Prevention of Corruption Act or let's say uh, other criminal act. The sanctioning authority is the governor at the state level. For that, he can use his discretion. Appointing a chief minister when there is no clear majority, discretion can be used. But discretion cannot be used to terminate the service of a minister. Because it is the prerogative of the chief minister as well as the legislature, not the governor's prerogative. Governor cannot cite 163 saying that I have a discretion. On the basis of that, I will apply my doctrine of pleasure and remove you. Doctrine of pleasure is not a discretionary power of the governor. I'm trying to link these two. Very complicated, I know, but I'm trying to make it simple for you. Governor cannot say that I have a discretion under 153 and based upon that I will do everything. If that is the case, then there won't be any system of government at state level. What is the purpose of having elected government? The governor can act as per his discretion. The point we are trying to say, governor's power with respect to pleasure is not his power. It is the power of the chief minister at the individual level of minister and the council ministers. It's the power of legislature at the collective level. It does not mean that governor cannot exercise discretion. Although the word pressure is not used in the 153, pressure is in 154. But if you link pressure and discretion, there are some areas in which discretion can be used, whose effect will be employment of pressure. For let's say, a council minister lost majority in the house, and the council minister refuses to quit, governor can dismiss the council minister. So actually, he is terminating. Although not using doctrine of pressure, but the in impact of this termination is, or impact of use of discretion is termination. The problem with the governor is not ending here. Recently, it seems that governors have some overestimated notion of their own authority or power. Telangana, Karna, uh, Telangana uh, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Rajasthan, Maharashtra earlier, everywhere you see this problem. Bills are not being signed. Bills are not being ascended. Interference in administration. Kerala, every day it is happening with respect to this chancellor of, ch chancellorship. There are laws, university laws, which make the governor chancellor of, chancellor, chancellor of university. Now, governor says, I will administer. Governor is using his power. Governor says, I will not appoint the recommendation given by you. I will do my own. I will call the meeting of Senate. Government says no. In a, in a parliamentary democracy, elected government is having primacy role. Governor and president have their own respective role. Right? But not intervening in day-to-day -day administration. But recently we see a lot of things. Like I mentioned, not giving assent to bill. Twitter war between governor of West Bengal and uh, the chief minister, who is now vice president of India. One governor of Telangana recently said that her phone is being tapped. One governor is keep going on speaking in Tamil Nadu with respect to language, culture, etc., etc. So instead of doing their job, what they are doing? But you keep in mind, their activities are uh, limited to those states which are ruled by other parties which is different from the ruling party at the center. So opposition ruled states have seen over enthusiastic functioning of the governors. And this is, an, this is a 
what we say, manifestation of these issues. You go home, you read the issue of governors as chancellors. Governors as chancellor of universities, which I have taught. You have that ED with you, read it. Try to link with it. Because everything started, started with this. Appointment, transfer, posting, etc. A lot of friction between state government and governor. Right. And one minister in Kerala said, governor does not know, etc., etc. Governor said, uh, whatever you said, it is derogatory uh, against no faith, dignity, etc. I am withdrawing my pleasure. So chief minister said, no, this is not your cup of tea. It is my prerogative as per constitution. What we are trying to say that the pleasure is not the individual pleasure of the governor. The, the role of governor in the parliamentary system of Indian governance is very limited. And the governor should stick to that. And let the elected government to function properly. But that does not mean that governor should not play his or her constitutional role. Privately, he can talk to the chief minister or ministers. Not in, it cannot be a public affair. He can even voice his opinion and concern. There are mechanisms provided in the constitution. For instance, Article 167 constitution, constitution 167. 167, what is Duty of the chief minister to communicate to the governor. So, mechanism is provided, na? And there are also, if it is a bill, we send it. For, what do you say? Reconfederation. So, the constitution provides mechanism, not to sort out things. Why are we not using it? Governor should use the constitutional mechanism provided to promote good governance in states. The interventions, activities of the governor should not be politically oriented. It should not be what we say. <coughs> Conflictual. If at all governor is intervening, governor is saying something, it should be to, it should be for course correction. Public, governor is not a public functionary in the sense that he is not, not an elected person. His role as per the constitution is not as a minister, role of a minister. Instead of getting into this controversies, governor should use his position to improve administration, governance, development, political stability in the state. That is why the Sarkari Commission said that no active politician should be appointed, should be given appointment as a governor. But you know that governors have not been appointed as per the recommendation of the commission. But doctrine of pleasure is a new bone of contention between governor and state government. Although this has to be seen in the larger context of center state relation. Governor is a linchpin in the cooperative federalism between center and states. A good center state relation, a good federal relation will mean a good governor state relation. On the one hand, we are promoting cooperative federalism. On the other hand, this is happening. So, for the governor to function properly, and there should be workable relation between state government and the governor, the larger federal relation should be improved. Clear what I am trying to say? Ultimately, who is appointing the governor? Center. And where is the problem happening? States. Which states? Opposition rule states. What does it show? Center state relation, sahi nahi hai. So, doctrine of pleasure should be read as per the constitutional scheme of things. Doctrine of pleasure has to be read as per the judgment of the Supreme Court. Constitutional, uh, doctrine of pleasure should be read as per the assembly debate. We are only dealing with political. We are not dealing with pressure of president over the governor. In fact, that is, the, that is one of the fundamental reasons for this issue. Because governor has no security of tenure. So he can be removed at will. It has happened, right? Whenever party changes, governors are being removed en masse. 
So if security tenure is provided, some kind of stability can be there. The person can do his function properly. But that is only one element, the larger center state relation. The state government should also be mature enough to deal with issues. We are not saying state government, everything it is doing is correct. So both the state government and the governor should come together and resolve issues and should work for the interest of people. If public interest is the motive of governor and state government, then they, they should work as per the constitutional scheme of things. Disagreement, divergence of opinion are necessary and it will be helpful to generate informed debate in the society. The ultimate end should be furthering public interest, not to promote conflicts. Instead of politics, public interest should guide the decision actions of government and state government. That is what we are trying to do. Okay? Third, third concern. What is time? 6.30. 34, 432 hours, yes. Fourth one, uh, th third one is? IAS. IAS. IAS, Governance System Critical Commentary. Recently, few articles have been written, especially from uh, senior retired functionary of union the union government, Dr. Subarao who retired as finance secretary and who later became RBI governor, said that IAS, of IAS has failed in Indian government. And few others have written that no, IAS has not failed, although it has some problems. So this debate has been going on. Whatever we are going to discuss here, although it is specifically focused upon IAS, it is, it is generally applicable to civil services. Because this content can be used where? in the whole civil services. Although I will be using only IAS, IAS, IAS. Now, <clears throat> somebody is saying that, I mean, the, the, there is a commentary or scholars, writers, you will see that IAS has failed. They have said, yes, they have failed. And uh, before uh, going into this assessment of failure, let us see what exactly the role of IAS in the Indian system. Kya role hai? Kya kaam karte hai? Why are you studying for UPSC to become an IAS officer? What reason? So, uh, what is socio-economic transformation is one of the role. So, again, what else? Law and order. Which means, yes, law and order, I would say, unity and integrity. Then, policy advice and implementation. I am here not using the word policy making because ultimately it is theoretically made by the elected government, right? So policy advice, although this advice is very hefty, senior, uh, let's say, uh, senior civil servants, senior IAS officers, for that matter, the content of policy is given by them. Because the politicians are laymen, like they are not experts, so they advise. Implementation is the pure domain of IAS or civil service. Service delivery. So, policy, they, you know, all, they, there cannot be any watertight compartment here, but again, socio-economic development, unity and integrity, policy advice, service delivery, social justice. social justice. This is already linked to this. Anyway, so, the Constitution of India provides some crucial role, function to the IAS. And you recall what Sardar Vallabhai Patel has said. Very famous quote, Sardar Vallabhai Patel, I have seen 
students writing this in uh, students writing this in yes yes very famous in uh, almost all the answer you will see, you will see this if you want a united india you want what an oil and resources not only that he has also uh, commented upon ias but so that shows the in fact the continuity of ias in the larger oil and resources is because of the insistence of adar valley patel now it has it shows that it has very significant beginning from the beginning from the commencement of commencement of constitution <clears throat> and you know that uh, the reason why most of the students opt for ias i mean let's say if you, if you get a very good rank your first choice generally will be ias why fit for compared to other services the members of the service have what good working condition there is salary increment increase salary is different not only that promotional opportunity career advancement what is the reason status prestige etc which means among the all these group of services ias is having some significant place in terms of prestige status in society in the governance system that is the reason constitution provides article 312 deals with ias and ips right so by looking at constitution by looking at social system by looking at various role the, the uh, ias has and looking at various constitutional functionaries like election commission of india cag etc being manned by senior ias officers retired or serving why why so not only that anyway leave it so we are saying that it has very significant role that is the reason government of india recently you remember this ias cadre rule amendment ias cadre rule amendment because the latest report says out of 6800 sanctioned strength of ias 20% should be at the union level on deputation abhi kitne hai 6% now you do the do the mathematics department of personal and training latest annual report hai keh raha hai this much of is sanctioned across state and center in fact states because there is no cadre of union sanctioned itna hai as per old services rules 20 person at any given point of time should be at the union level manning secretary manning the various departments but abhi kitna hai 6 percent hai acute shortage even try to amend the ias rules sorry old ias rules which created created a controversy mandatory reporting of the ias officers from the state to union level not only that government is undergoing change of like lateral entry shortage and for every problem government or let's say ministers or other uh, commentator criticizes ias if ias is not having any such role then why, why this is happening right what i'm trying to say these developments show that the importance of ias so it is established that ias among the other services have an <coughs> importance very very huge significance so if they have huge significance then the expectation of of the society will be also high if you are and you are you are a very bright student when you start preparing for the field services there is high hope high expectation on you from your family your friends and others that you will clear the examination expectation similarly ias having very significant role it is known for that so there is high expectation if the iaf does not live up to the expectation then there will be this criticism of failure now one group of people say they have failed 
other group of people say they have not failed but other group do not say that ias all good i mean everything is fine with the ias no they are simply saying okay there are weaknesses there are problems but that it, it does not mean that you sing, single handedly hold, hold responsible this uh, ias ias does not work in vacuum it is part of a larger system that has to be taken care of again so let us see failure i will give you some point, uh, some idea about this failure why failure one example i'll give you andaman chief secretary that then then andaman chief secretary has been arrested recently because sex for job scam sex for job it is an allegation a chief arrested so keep that in mind but still a person who has become chief secretary right and the police has arrested and says the person has gone to various courts to still the court did not entertain in that way so this is something when the person was chief secretary of andaman and nicobar in lieu, lieu of sexual favors provided appointment to women chief secretary administrative is a different function you know administrator is like a left hand governor administrator is above chief secretary administrator may be equivalent to the chief minister sorry the, the governor because ut of andaman does not have elected legislature it is administered by administrator appointed by the president but he is only the head equivalent to the governor formal type but administration is under the control of chief secretary whether it is ut or state you will find chief secretary right so he has been accused of this one example another puja puja uh, that jharkhand cadre senior officer puja singhal yes mining secretary narega scam huge let's leave this hdi world press freedom index global hunger index what is the ranking of india abysmal very poor we have a topic dealing with ghi so what about rule of law in this country there is something called rule of law index 2 rule of law hate speech is also part of rule of law a district magistrate has also has also powers under crpc rule of law is also being impacted what about unity of unity and unity and uh, integrity of this country seems to be okay fine yes yes sir so unity of integrity stability of this country as is concerned there might not be some uh, issue might not be such issues but when you see this corruption at the highest level we tip yes again there is one what is that corruption by perception index recently said the indian civil service indian bureaucracy is the most corrupt in the in this region and our uh, ranking has been declined so in whether it is individual large scale there are so many scams 2g scam cold scam other scam this what we say noida scam so individual level collective level as far as social justice or economy economic for this is economy unemployment in the country 
press, human development, hunger. So when you see that the areas which are actually the domain, which, which the subject matters generally administered by a department whose head, the senior officers are generally IAS officers. And at a district level, it's a district character. So senior officers who are supposed to advise for policy, supervise the policy, monitor, and also implement under their supervision are IAS. Many posts in this country are, countries are cadered post, which means only people belonging to that cadre in this context, IAS can hold their post. A chief secretary can only be IAS. Sorry, no, no, it's not like that. <coughs> District magistrate. And there are some posts which are cadred posts. Only IAS can be appointed. So despite IAS officers manning such crucial significant posts, country's performance has been coming down on a larger level as well as individual level. The fish rots at the head. Matlab yeah, you know, the problem is that the road, the problem starts at the top level. If the boss is not good, then the entire organization is going to go. If there is corruption at the top level, definitely there will be corruption at the corruption at the lower level, middle level. So ethical level, corruption level, performance level, the IA seems to be failing. And what about other f f behavior features like elitism, class mentality? We are dealing with this topic. What's your name? Pooja. We are dealing with this topic whether IAS has failed the nation. Right? <clears throat> Although the exact name of the topic is not that, but that, uh, that's the essence of it. So, at the individual level, at the broader level, and yes, behavioral, elitism, status quo, that I will work within the structure. I will not move out of it. Lack of innovation. Deguram Rajan has said that Indian bureaucracy is one of the major problem of India's lack of development and progress. Ah, domain specialization. So we are saying that senior retired officers of IAS and various other commentators who are renowned have been telling that the IAS has become a plastic frame. Instead of steel frame, it has become a hollow frame. There is nothing in it. There is increasing politicization. There is lack of neutrality. So, the, the fundamental tenets of the IAS have been compromised. So, one group of people are saying the IAS has failed this nation. From a social socioeconomic angle, rule of law, corruption, ethics, etc., failed. One group of people saying no. Wo keh rahe ki, yes, there are some issues with IAS, but it is incorrect and misconceived to point out the fingers only at the IAS. In fact, they provide some kind of examples. World Bank study 6 7. 2006 2007, World Bank has conducted a study in India. It said that most of the reforms at the state level with respect to administration, service delivery, etc., have been initiated and successfully implemented by IAS officers. World Bank says. There is a 2017 study. The name of the study is not available, but a senior retired IAS officer has written that in this study it is found that as far as unity and integrity, stability of the nation is concerned, IAS has become, has been excellent. This we can agree. Because the problem India faced during partition and in 40s and 50s and 60s are not the same at this point in time. 
right? The problem of <coughs> sufficient are not the same at this point in time. Infergency, internal security challenges, etc., have been abated, reduced. We are not saying completely eliminated. Without stability, no development can be possible. In hate speech, there will not be any co co social cohesion. Anyway, leave, leave hate speech. What is the developmental status in, in Central India? I am saying Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh. Leaf developed. There is something, anyway, leave it. Leaf developed. Because one of the major reasons is lack of stability, lack of rule of law. Whenever a road is built, insurgents come, they blow up. Whenever people are going, they kill them. So if development is all about infrastructure, physical infrastructure must be there, connectivity must be there, communication transportation must be there. So, but the rule of law is not <coughs> promoted. Rule of law becomes a casualty. So without stability, development is not possible. So administration should fo focus upon both developmental and non-developmental, which means development, road, all those things, socio-economic development. Non-development means stability, rule of law, law and order. So this, is, this, has, this has become important, this has been important during 40s and 50s and still important at this point in time. Without stability, there cannot be any progress. Right? But stability does not mean maintaining status quo. Stability and continuity should go together. Anyway, so unity and integrity. They are saying that there are some concrete studies in which IAS have been uh, given what we say very uh, visible or very important position in the sense that these studies have highlighted the actual functions of the IAS offices. It says reform at the state level have been initiated by the IAS, successfully implemented. I can give you one example, self help group, self help group Kudumbashri, brainchild of an IAS officer in Kerala senior one. Now you know the importance and the success of Kurumbashri. Mid day, not mid day mail scheme, what is that? Uh, very important scheme at the union level. Hmm. Dealing with schooling, uh, not mid day mail scheme, there is one, not, yes, no, no, not this, ASHA. Not schooling, this is ASHA. This acronym is given by an IAS officer. This has been the, the brainchild of him. TN Station was also an IAS officer. Known for what? Electoral reforms. Most of the higher constitutional functionaries are posted held by IAS officers. The system of ASHA. Accredited social health activist at the uh, local level. And as, as a part of National Health Mission. Yes, Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, SSA. This is what I'm trying to locate. Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Which means schooling for all. Again, brain of one IS also. We have provided some kind of example in your booklet also. Some other. COVID-19, don't you see that in COVID-19, who managed the COVID-19 properly? I mean, the, 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 the district... Yes, district has been the focal point. If I am saying some names to you, can you recall or can you relate or do you remember this name, Iqbal Singh Chahal? Do you remember? Why do you remember? Because he has done some good work. Rajendra Bhatt, do you remember Bilwara? There are so many. 
So to say that IAS has failed, that's very incorrect. Because see, the question is, are there any math mathematical formula upon which we can judge this failure? In your examination, in your examination, I will give an example of PT examination. 2022, general category, almost 87. If you score 87, you are pass. If you score below 87, you are fail. Are there any mathematically uh, uh, mathematical criteria? Are there any score as far as this IAS is concerned? Can we judge the performance of IAS based upon any quantitative criteria? Can we do that? Are hey, aisa wala kuch? Nahi hai na? Three fifty degree, degree appraisal. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to say is there any criteria like this? On the basis of appraisal, can you say you have failed? How many people have been thrown out of service on the basis of appraisal? The function of Sarah probability, etc., they have different purpose. They do not provide any quantitative criteria. They rank the people, fine, I agree. The mark in your ACR is given, this much, this much, this much. But you must know that almost all the marks are given high. Almost all the appraisal system in this country who are being appraised, it is given very high. Good performance, excellent. That is the rank it is given. Ultimately, institution is, the fundamental pillar of institution is individual. Not rule, not rule, not law. Ultimately, individual should work out the institution. Anyway, just because of there are some corruption, there are some issues. You cannot say that entire IA system or IA institution is failed. First of all, there are, if you are providing some, some examples that see, our performance in Global Hunger Index or Human Development Index, etc., etc., very poor. Right, the hate speech is happening, rule of law is there, problem. Mobile is happening, politician has happened. Right. But we can also provide some other examples like I have provided. It is very much important to keep in mind that we are dealing with a public issue. It cannot operate in vacuum. This is not science as such. Matlab, I have it and it That's not like, it's not like that. It's a gray area. There are multiple viewpoints. Our approach is to study dispassionately the problems. Yes, we agree that there are problems. But there are also good examples, good uh, practices. Right? The reason why government is appointing lateral entrance is because there are shortages and vacancies. It shows importance for IAS. Why, the reason why state governments are not willing to relieve IAS officers to deputy the center is because of state governments want. The reason why society has this immense respect and prestige status towards IAS is because of that. The point we are trying to say, if you cite some points, example of development to show that IAS has failed, I will say that see, these are counterpoints. But that does not mean that IAF does not have any problem. What are the problems of IAF? Again, I'm telling you we are, what we are discussing. Time to go here, Fade Char, Fat. What are I'm using? IAF. We can use it for entire field services. But again, our discussion is on, is on IAS. Problem hai. Kya problem hai? The greatest problem in this field services in India is incentive and disincentive issue.
no premium for performance no penalization for lack of performance acha kaam karoge to acha promotion milega acha posting milega galat kaam karoge to kuch nahi milega there is no linkage the personal management process of the ias is not governed by performance rather it is governed by extraneous considerations posting transfer promotion empanelment these are decided not based upon uh, per, let's say performance if it is not based on performance will i have any incentive to perform better it is rather seen that a person who is trying to do his job honestly he is penalized 53 times kisko mila hai transfer nahi not ashok kaim ka there is another person person uh, some tiwari or desai something but again uh, more than ashok kaim ka is also largest number of transfer is not ashok kaim ka it is someone else i'll tell you in the next class but again we know that ashok kaim ka has been transferred there is a first ranger in kerala raju narayana swami is well for first ranger he has been denied promotion not only that government wanted to compulsorily retire him because politically unpalatable so the personal process there is fairness merit based till recruitment uske baad khatam ho jata hai upsc is the recruitment what happens after that the government will have control proper ultimate control so when government has control autonomy is, is impacted transfer promotion suspension everything etc etc will be based upon the government's priorities how politically malleable you are your administrative competence are not the judge that does not matter that's a fact until and unless the system is improved nothing can be done people who do not perform properly again lack of performance should be objectively evaluated those who do not perform properly should be trained retrained or shown the door people who perform properly should be given adequate opportunity to excel in their vocation in their service career advancement should not be based upon political consideration this system has to be perfectly implemented this is something that is a second irc has said performance management system for entire field services is required we do not have this performance management system what is performance management system of a different issue which general studies students do not require to understand properly right performance management system is required this will streamline the entire working of the field servants and objectively evaluate and will assign the opportunities promotion posting based upon the domain cap capacity competency of the individual this will be depoliticized but this has not been the case this is the crux of it rest everything are secondary addendum adjuncts this is in this there is what we say consensus that is what i am why i am using it fifth pay commission also said this second year has also said that the recent debate is also saying this there are many other issues fine but this has to be the case under this everything else is depending because this will streamline your process an individual an ai officer will not be working for the interest of the political system or the government because when it is streamlined he knows that my work will be rewarded 
my work will be rewarded rather than my loyalty to the government. Loyalty is required, but loyalty to the political party. The loyalty of the field servant or IAS is to the constitution and the people of this country. And loyalty should be towards his work or her work. Everybody wants to move ahead in their career. Everybody wants reward. Because reward helps you to perform better. So when you streamline this, most of the problem will solve. Most of the, I am not saying everything will fall. Or put it differently, this should be the beginning point of reforming. Incentivize and dis... Incentivization and disincentivization. That is why I have discussed another topic dealing with uh, all the services. Do you remember? What is that topic? Agnipad-like scheme in uh, all the services. Right? So, what exactly is this Agnipath? Jo acha kaam karega, wo aage jayega. Jo nahi karega, bahar jayega. Second IRC ne kaha, bhai, 14 years mein, 14 years review the performance. Give warning. Sudar jau. 20 years, again review. Agar improve nahi hai, to remove. But the point again I'm trying to say, this system has to be streamlined. Because who will judge? What criteria will be there? <clears throat> it is necessary that the IAS officers or IAS as an institution should be reformed. But it is you know, incorrect, inappropriate to say that all the problems of IAS is because of IAS itself. IAS does not operate in vacuum. IAS being the instrument of the government and the people work in a framework of law, rules, politics, public opinion, judicial intervention. So there are many factors. You first provide an enabling environment for the field service to function properly. Then you can judge. If you are not writing a good answer, if you are not giving me reply properly, then I cannot find fault in you. It is my fault. If the politics is inter interfering, not upholding the independence of service, it is not the problem of service. It is the problem of politics. But that does not mean that field servant or IAS do not have the power to resist. It is not... It is <clears throat> it does not also mean that field servant, the corruption in field service or IAS is because of politics. No. There are individual problems, there are systemic problems. Systemic system. All these problems need to be addressed. One important problem, one important, not problem, method in order to address the problem of deficiencies in governance. Ultimately, IAS, ka kaam kya hai? Governance. Development, social justice, etc., etc., etc. I am suggesting there should be better decentralization at the local level. The problem of IAS or for that civil service or administration can be addressed by empowering the local government institution. Administration at the local level is not accountable to the local government. They are accountable to state government, union government. Kaam kahaan kar rahe? Local level pe. Accountability kahaan hai? Loyalty kahaan pe? Yahaan pe. To yahaan kuch bhi karo, koi matlab nahi hai. You need to empower the grassroots level institutions, PRF and urban local bodies. Let though there be one political, one top political leadership. And the lender administration should function under that political setup. There should be something called district government or district council as recommended by second ARC. USA mein kya hota USA or UK, what, what happens? USA, the mayor is all powerful. The district police chief or attorney, every person works under this fellow. So democracy has gone down to third tier. District, the local area of the scene of action for everything. 
But administrator at the local level is not accountable, responsible to the elected representatives at the local level. They are employees of state government and the union government. What we are saying, the administration should be kept under the, should be brought under the overall supervision of local government and local government should be empowered. Both personal as well as service. Like USA and UK. Accountability problem can be resolved. Administration will be more responsive. People will become more active. They feel ownership in the events happening in their, in, in, in their backyard. Right? Better decentralization, devolution of power at the local level, equipping the grassroots level institutions, both financially, politically, is required. Because administration <coughs> is an action-oriented institution. And action happens at the local level. At the local level, administration, you should be accountable to the local people. Otherwise, if let's say, I'm not working properly, my head or department head fitting in at the capital. So will I have any fear in my mind that the person will check me or he will ask me, etc., etc. There is no day-to-day -day accountability. There will be some accountability, the person will come someday and check. But I know that I am accountable to the people around me. So I will improve my functioning. Do, do you think why it is, what is the reason behind citizen charter, this what, uh, RTI, etc., etc.? You have to make administration accountable, innovative. So what we are saying, district collector or the IS officer at the district level, is accountable to the union government and the state, not the local level. In order to remove the lethargy, complacency, status quoism, elitism, and very further dysfunctionalities of the IAS, they should be brought under the control of the district, district elected body, like in the Western countries and other democracies. But apart from that, <coughs> some structural arrangements like recommendation by the second IRC, this uh, streamlining personal management system, depolitization of our administration, moral development of the IAS officers, right? And proper career advancement are also required. नहीं आ रही बिल्कुल भी कब से शुरू से ऐसा ही है क्लियर नहीं है सोंड अमित ठीक है मैं देखता हूँ अभी ठीक है थोड़ा ऊपर कर लेते हैं फिर ये नीचे करूँ अच्छा तो मेरे वॉइस का प्रॉब्लम है फाइन ग्लोबल चैलेंजेस एंड ग्लोबल गवर्नमेंट आई विल रश राइट 4:30 7:30 फाइन दिस आर वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट एंड बट इट इज समथिंग व्हिच यू कैन योरसेल्फ डू ग्लोबल चैलेंजेस एंड ग्लोबल गवर्नमेंट Global challenges and global government. Is there any some? Is there a, is there any uh, global government at this point in time? Global government like we have state government, we have central government in India, and we have Chinese government in China, USA government in USA. Is there any? Is there any global government? What is the essence of government? What, when, uh, the essence, sorry? Sir, social contract is the essence of government. Social contract is the essence of government, fine. Good governance essence. Authority to take decision, social contract, yes, everything is linked. I would say sovereignty is the essence.
Indian government is internally sovereign, externally sovereign. Which means Chinese government cannot dictate to India that you should carry out your government like this manner. USA cannot dictate to India that you should join us as a military partner. WTO cannot dictate to India, although leave it, leave WTO. <coughs> UK cannot dictate to India that you should sign this free trade agreement in this manner. Sovereignty, complete authority, superior authority. Sovereignty is the essence of government and state. Although the terms state and government are different, but I am using it interchangeably because there are various nations in this world. Like almost 193, as per UN, as per UN. They have their own government. And every government is having sovereignty. They are independent. Which means the way the government should function will be decided by the government elected by people. In a democracy. But Government is the important aspect of state and government uses sovereignty on behalf of the state, which is the institution. Population, government, sovereignty, territory. This is what state. Now the question is, Sovereignty is exercised by whom? Ter territory is cannot because it is inactive. Population. In direct democracy, people, people can exercise it. But in indirect, who will do it? Government. So government exercises sovereignty. Parliamentary sovereignty. <coughs> so government exercises sovereignty on behalf of the people. Or state sovereignty is exercised by government. So every nation is independent and sovereign. But the problem that humanity encounter at this juncture is very huge. These problems are not confined to national borders. These problems are threatening human civilization. It has international ramifications. And in order to resolve these issues, we need international cooperation and consensus and coordination. What are the problems the humanity is facing? Multiple. One example is war. Oil crisis. Oil crisis. Climate. Ah, yes, yes. Globalization of supply chains. Globalization of supply chains. Is, is, is it a problem? <laughs> no, no, Disruption of supply chains might be a problem. Right? Or protectionism in the context of globalization is a problem? No. Sir, one specific word that Jay Shankar used was, uh, hmm. uh, I am not remembering it. Hmm. Okay. So, can you tell me the meaning of it? It's not necessary. The, that China has used supply chain for its own advantage. Means in COVID disruption, it did not supply the raw materials to the country who criticized it for the COVID. So, it is not globalization per se. It is actually, if, if there is globalization of supply chain, then the supply chain, the, the, the location of supply will be available, I mean, the, the uh, regions which provide the supplies, no, no, no country will have monopoly over the supply. Globalization is free. Free trade is the essence of globalization. If China is using monopoly over those active pharmaceutical ingredients, then it is against the concept of globalization. If globalization is actually free, then there should have been various places which are having the capacity to produce these supplies or provide supplies. I understand your point. But seen from the actual perspective of globalization, right? Supply chain should be non-disruptive. Production should not be monopolized. Monopoly is against globalization. Monopoly is against free trade. Protectionism is against free trade. Right? It's a problem that 
global effect does not mean that you take your, uh, let's say, business and you keep it in another country. Sir, I'm sorry, sir. It was not globalization. It was weaponization of something. Acha. <laughs> Thik hai, fine. Weaponization. The weaponization happened because, because global effect did not function properly. Companies, right? Had that been the, see, the idea of global effect is uh, what is said. Breaking down barriers. Whether it is economic, post political, social, etc., etc. Which means no country should be using its position to pr uh, prevent people having access to critical supplies. You should not stop your border. You should not create artificial barriers. Whether it is, whether it is people, technology, or others. But again, failure of globalization is a problem. Right? Or deglobalization is a problem. Terrorism is a problem. There are many new uh, technologies which are being developed. Artificial intelligence is one. Robotics is one. In, in, in space, a new race is going on in space. So on top of the existing crucial challenges the humanity faces, there are multiple other new challenges. But the question is whether the humanity is equipped to meet these challenges or whether the existing global institutions are able to tackle the problems humanity is facing. The reason why global institutions are existing right from 40s and 50s is because to tackle these global problems, whether it is UN, WTO, World Bank, and the uh, IPCC, or let's say, not IPCC, this UNFCC. So we have specialized institutions at the global level to deal with various problems. The UN becoming the primary institution at the global level. But do you think that these institutions are able to, at this point in time, prevent uh, or let's say, address the challenges humanity is facing. Global institutions at the global level, the world level, are mandated with addressing many problems. One example I can give you, UN. Why this has been established? To prevent another world war, to promote world peace and security. And one of the primary instruments of UN is UNFC. Has UNFC been successful in preventing the war? Where? Ukraine, Russia. Yes or no? Do you think that the impact of this war is confined to Ukraine and Russia? It is impacting the entire world? What about other wars? India, Pakistan, India, China, perpetual war. North Korea, South Korea, perpetual. This point happening. North Korea is filing missiles over Japan and South Korea. China, Taiwan, almost problem. Two days blockade of Taiwan by China, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, border war, Armenia, Azerbaijan, war, Israel, Palestine, all is happening, Middle East, civil war in Africa, guerrilla war, terrorism in Colombia. If I draw a global map here, world map, I can, the entire world is in turmoil. I'm just giving you an example. Let's take climate change. Two degrees Celsius is going above. Nothing is happening. Global Climate Fund is not operational. 2015 Paris Climate Deal is non-starter. There are un uh, unseasonal rain, floods, heat waves. <coughs> the low-lying countries, the Pacific Island countries are facing problems. Migration. Refugee crisis. COVID-19, WHO, kya kya? World Health Organization supposed to address these issues. Still, we do not know the origin of COVID-19. WHO on behalf of China documented a delayed the declaration of pandemic. WTO has failed to ensure free trade. Protectionism is something which is being practiced by countries these days. There is no dispute settlement mechanism. 
the, the primary instrument of w, WTO. Terrorism. Again, UNFC and UN supposed to address these issues. The entire world is affected by terrorism. Still, the world has not come to a consensus on what exactly is terrorism. Recently, two days before Belgium, one policeman was killed. Right wing terrorism. Scandinavian countries, too, which have been abodes of peace and harmony. New Zealand, Christchurch, Christchurch attack. Sri Lanka, India, and their Middle East, Syria, Boko Haram, Nigeria, Somalia, Mali, FARC, Colombia. Still, the world has not been able to reach to a definition of what is terrorism. There is a difference between good terrorism and bad terrorism. Who is a terrorist? China recently blocked India's attempt to what? Designate some individual, individual set as terrorist. India proposed CCIT, Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism in 1990s. Still, it is in draft. Terrorism is something which is impacting everybody. Internet, hate speech, social media, no governance. Pollution. Inequality, hunger, pandemic. Biodiversity, ecology, rich and poor divide, super rich, transnational corporation, the private sector, the control of private sector over governments, how to control them. There are a lot of pressing challenges the humanity is facing. The existing global institutions are not incapable at this point in time to address these challenges satisfactorily, which generated a debate on something called a global government. A global government, a government at the global level having sovereignty, which will provide binding direction to the governments at the, I mean, the, the governments Matlab, this will provide directive, do this, don't do that, then the government had to abide by it. The question is whether establishing such a global government, having sovereignty over nation states, is viable and whether they will, it will solve the problems the humanity is facing. Can we transform the UN to a global government, having sovereignty? Which means UN will take decision and other countries will obey. And based on, hence, all the problems will be resolved. Perfect answer. No, sir. Why? Yes, yes, <laughs> very good. All of you have provided vital inputs, fantastic. But I would say that this proposition will take the world back to Westphalia. Westphalia means earlier they were, there were empires. Rome Empire, Mughal Empire, Sassanid Empire, Austrian Empire, etc., etc. But later, states were formed, having sovereignty. Why? Because people said that 
my language is this my culture is this so i will govern we will form a different group and we will govern and we will decide our own affairs why pakistan one of the reason pakistan was demanded the muslim league said muslims are a different nation we we are different cultural entity so we are different we will decide our own affairs so sovereignty we will have sovereignty we will have ultimate authority to decide what we should do so empires were broken down nations were created having sovereignty so when we are suggesting a global government is like going back to the earlier system because sovereignty of nation state is impacted when sovereignty is impacted sovereignty is taken and given to this person who grew global government when sovereignty is impacted the state there is no many state when sovereignty is given to him the state is not there concept of nation state will not exist so it is like merging here everything is merged and you know that the reason why nation state is formed is because because of cultural peculiarities the absolute and authoritative approach of other the the monarchy or the empire and to have better administration at the local level better governance for that matter there is a concept called small is beautiful why do you think they in indian constitution there has been no con concept of third and third tier of government till 90s why do you think the government constitutionally established third tier improve governance improve administration right that is, that is for development governance social justice etc can be better <coughs> implemented at the local level so the contemporary trend is toward decentralization devolution top down matlab top down in the sense from top to down but we are going away but the fundamental problem is conceptual level the fundamental problem with this proposal is nation state will came to nullity they won't be they, the the existence of nation state will be impact, impacted they won't be in nation state it will be going to the westphalia westphalia 16 which year uh 1648 sure yes sir okay 1648 here the the various uh, various empires or countries came together and they said that we will not attack each other sovereignty is granted so that has been the become of the basis of state formation later nation the feelings of nation language culture etc came and nation formed so this is like going back again and not only that this global government does not ensure satisfactory uh, resolution of problems whenever there is a big government instead of resolving problems it creates more problems one example i'll give you ussr why ussr disintegrated why ussr disintegrated it said to large to govern yes it has become it is very it has become very large almost more than half of the europe under ussr i am sitting in moscow i am making policy no computer no internet thousands of kilometers mein kya hoga wahan pe agriculture what will be made there what will people eat what work people will do mismatch centralization <coughs> when you study what do you do you take some topic and study you you let's say bifurcate right it's not like that you take everything and study you systematically you study you break things down similarly whenever there is big it is bound to fail one of the classic example is ussr one of the classic example is roman empire so many places every road led to rome it had control over almost africa let's say entire europe and some part of asia failed broken down too big to govern 
for centralization is not necessarily required centralization global government is against constitutive sovereignty the nation state it will lead to more centralization and history tells us that whenever there is centralization there is lack of development there is more conflict than uh, resolutions one point uh, the student has said the existing world order is highly unequal west and the rest east and the west poor country rich country this global government will be based upon the world view of the rich countries it will reproduce the existing inequalities the world system at this point in time is unequal the power is in the hand of the rich countries the west that is why we are talking about reform reform wto reform unsc reform un reform world bank reform imf imf is always headed by a european world bank is always headed by an american kyun bhai kyun because the governance starter says that so do you think that do you think that this is a correct approach there should be equality of nations sovereign equality of nation is the governing principle at the international level sovereign equality of nations when you have a global government it will reproduce the existing inequality because the richer nations will have more control over it so rather than solving problem it will create more dissensions so what we must do rest you read kya karna chahiye existing institution needs to be needs to be reformed rather than UNGA. yes you ngi you yes yes <clears throat> we need to prioritize the problem the world is facing and the existing institutions needs to be strengthened but there are we can also focus on the regional level regional level solution can also be focused on for instance india india pakistan farc let's take farc there are many problems poverty is one major issue terrorism also pakistan is also suffering from terrorism india is also suffering so why can't this farc or let's say the south asian region came together and discuss and try to resolve problems why can't east asia i am talking about japan china taiwan south korea north korea etc because the problem they face is not the problem like west uk does not have pakistan as, as its neighbor usa does not have does not have china as its neighbor it it is india india is suffering from terrorism so it it cannot wait till the un defines what is terrorism it should take the region should take initiative for in free trade that is the reason recently there have been let's say uh, more focus on regional tra trade agreements at the local level one example is rcep regional level asean fta is also happening asean apec ha ha plurilateral pluri or regional level tra trade groups can also be there so there are many problem which can be solved at the regional level a country may not be able to solve but the regional level can be solved Mul multiple problem so regional level solution should also be focused right and reform is reforming the various institutions are very much required reforming and make it e equal the institution should function based upon sovereign equality of nations rather than the existing inequality the control of west over global institution should be replaced by control by all world bank imf also be reformed wto i think we have taken an ed on uh, wto not me another faculty have taken sir have taken on that we have discussed with this wto what reform must be there 
As far as UNSC is concerned, in the last lecture, I have discussed a lot of things. So fundamental, the conclusion is that a global government having sovereignty over the entire world nations is impractical, non-feasible because it is against the concept of sovereignty and there is no guarantee that the world government will be able to resolve the problem. Instead of solving the problem, the centralization through world government will create more problems. And history tells us that whenever there is more centralization, there, is, there are more problems. So instead of focusing upon uh, this global government, we should focus upon various other aspects which can resolve the problems that humanity faces, including better coordination, consultation, consensus between the national states and regional level solution can also be focused, right? And reforming the entire institutional architecture at the global level is also required. Our purpose is not to solve the problem. What is our purpose, Pooja? Our purpose is what? My purpose, your purpose is what? Study to write an answer. Whether whatever we are discussing is actually transferred into action or solve the problem is immaterial as an aspirant. Yes, it is material for us to that it should be resolved. But whatever we are saying are logical. It must, it, it might not translate into reality. I am saying IMF and World Bank should be reformed. I am saying UNSC should be reformed. But every lecture we say this. We provide suggestions, we provide uh, modalities, guidelines, etc, etc. Have anything happened? It will happen or it will not happen. That does not matter. Right. What matters is that you understand the concept nicely and you write a good answer. As far as you are uh, you, you an aspirant is concerned. You as an aspirant is concerned. Okay? Next. Chalte uh, Panch. Global Hunger Index. 4.30, 7.30. Yes. Global Hunger Index. Failure of IAS. <laughs> See, this is what I am telling you, linkage. Kya rang India ka? 120, sorry, 109, 107. Kya hai? 107. Out of 121, 122? 121. This is rank. Score kya hai? Twenty nine point one. Usme nahi hai. <clears throat> Global hunger index has been recently published, which has painted a very dismal picture of the hunger situation in India. Which has, but the government of India rejected this finding. Government said this hunger index is incorrect, inappropriate because there, there are so many problems in hunger index, so we are rejecting it. Now we are going to see this hunger index, what is the rank, what is the score and what is the criteria behind it and uh, what are the problems in the hunger index, are there hunger in India actually, if at all what can be done about hunger, we have provided, we have made this uh, booklet, this booklet, especially this one and others too. Comprehensively, if you read it properly, there are a lot of information, a lot of uh, valid information, facts, which will help not only in GS2, but GS3 too. The food security, hunger, etc. also come uh, as per uh, under the economy. Okay? So, <clears throat> India's ranking from 2014 to 22 is uh, significant, significantly declining. 14, 16. Do one thing, let us take the uh, article. It will be easy. But not Who said not rank based? Hmm? Then what is the rank of, uh, rank of 107? What is It can be? You can compare with the country, also you can compare with other countries. In South Asia, only Afghanistan is below India. Rest every country is having good rank than India in Global Hunger Index. 
The purpose of an index is to compare, to tell you what, where exactly you stand, what can be taken, what, uh, what is the reason behind it. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. My rank in 2021 field for examination was 102. But my rank in 2022 field for examination is 52. What does it mean? It means that I have improved my rank. Right? How much was it? 102? Rank? What did you get from the service? IPS. Now, how do you compare a nation? How do you compare a nation? In field services, students are compared on the basis of their mark and ranks are given and services are allocated. So the class under which comparison is happening is UPSC students, the people who are giving examination. Here comparison is between nations. So nations are the class. This is not only GHI, there are multiple indices. If you are doing business, if you are also comparing nations. World, freedom, World Press Freedom Index also comparing. Global Competitive Index also comparing. Rule of Law, Economic Freedom. So many are, are there. Government of India is also, uh, <coughs> what we say, establishing or in fact established and published indices. Nidhi Aayog, FDG index, comparing states, water index, education health index, good governance index, DOPT. Why? Benchmarking, comparison, good practices to provide input to policy makers. See, this is the problem. These are the criteria upon which we judged you, right? So, it shows, it, it shows a mirror to the government and to the people. The purpose of an index is not to criticize or let's say, uh, uh, what is the right word to use? Tarnish the image of a country or a group of people, no. It is not, we are, the index might have some biases because, because ultimately it is made by human. But apart from that, it is not deliberately constructed to paint uh, the nation in a bad light. No. UPSC, while checking in the examiner, while checking in the answer, the main answer, might have some subjective bias. Objective question will have only one answer. But main answer, it is subjective. And the person checking your paper might not be same. You, you might be different, mine might be different. So human is checking. So because human is checking, then there might be some differences. So that might not, be, might not be deliberate. You belong to this caste, you belong to this region, you belong to this language, so I will not give you mark. Then that is deliberate. Such ranking, such marks are not fair. But these indices, most of them are fair. Right? Anyway, hunger index. Very important from PT examination. Calculated by IFPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, calculated, published by European NGO, Confident Worldwide and what? Weltunger Life or Welter Life. Clear? Very important for PT examination. So these are some criteria. This indices, anyway, leave it. First of all, Yes, this one. Overview of India's rank. Leho, 55, 80. 97, 100, 103, 102, 94, 101, 107, 55 to 107. Kya hua? Theek hai, fine, I agree. Number of countries are different. Number of countries are not same. But still, 55 to 107. Almost doubled. Are kuch to hua hoga? Right? And the difference is not that much here also. So they are saying as per this rank, India's performance as far as hunger index is concerned, declining. 
significantly declining if you compare 14 to 107 although the number of countries analyzed are different but still this is a huge gap this you must agree 29.1 is the score India has. 29.1 mein kya hai? You see the serious. Dekha Serious. Hunger is in serious condition in India. Now the point is there are four criteria under which hunger index is made. Kaun sa criteria hai? U C cube. Code hai. U C cube. This is the code. Four criteria. One, two, three, four. I have to rush. One is what? Undernourishment. Undernourishment. Second, C means child. 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 Standing. Wasting. Mortality. Mortality under five. ठीक है? Undernourishment. Entire population will be counted. This is a representative of entire population, which means women, this only child, children, under 5. So this is only child, this is entire population. Standing matlab kya? Standing means low height for age. Low height for age. Wasting means low weight for height. Low weight for height. Mortality, under 5 mortality. Okay? So this is the criteria under which they are measuring and according to them, India hunger is very poor. Okay? <coughs> but the government is saying that this, this index does not represent the situation in India. <coughs> India, because this uh, index has problems, methodological, sampling and uh, there are other problems also. Let us see what the government is saying. Government is saying that See, you are taking this index, fine. But one third of your, not one third, two third, na? two third of your index is dealing with child. So your, ultimately your index is based upon child. So it does not reflect the entire population. So constructing an index on the entire country or for the entire country based upon huge weightage for children is not scientific. Valid point? Hey, kini? Valid hai? Dekho, only population, o o whole population. Matlab, this representative of all population, with the respect of age. One third is children, not one third, two third. Two third weightage is given to children. मतलब चार क्राइटेरिया में तीन क्राइटेरिया क्या है चिल्ड्रन का है एंड ऑन द बेस ऑफ दैट यू आर कंस्ट्रक्टिंग इंडेक्स फॉर एंटायर पॉपुलेशन एंटायर कंट्री दिस इज अनसाइंटिफिक अगर करना ही है तो इक्वल वेटेज हो सबको ऑन द बेस ऑफ चिल्ड्रन यू आर कंस्ट्रक्टिंग ए इंडेक्स फॉर एंटायर पॉपुलेशन आवर पर्पस इज टू डिवाइस पॉइंट्स they have an uh, uh, argument. Who? The, the people who constructed this, let's say, index have an argument against this. But we will see that government is saying this. Government is saying that the index is tarnished by India's image. Tarnish kar rahe bahar. And government has said that whenever an index is against the government. Matlab? World Press Freedom Index, Human Development Index. In sub main India ka position kya hai? Niche hai. Niche ho raha hai So government keh raha hai ki yeh sab index jo hai, wo hamari image ko tarnish kar raha hai. All these images, indexes are tarnishing the images of India. And the purpose of these index or indices are to tarnish the image of India. But whenever ESO doing business gave good ranking to India, Whenever global competitive index gave good ranking to India, Indian government accepted it. So whenever the rankings are bad, Indian government say, tarnish ho rahe, tarnish ho rahe. Achha ranking hai, to kya keh rahe hai? Sahi hai. Thik hai? 
and government also say that the methodology adopted by this hunger index is flaw quality. Methodology means क्या कहता है? Phone उठाया, पूछ लिया लोगों से. Survey kind of method. So which is not scientific, or which is the sample size. The country is more than 1.3 billion. 1.2 more than 1.2 billion. You are calling, you are you are conducting the survey for around 3,000 people something. So how 3,000 can be representative of this 1.3 billion? Sample size is very less. So because sample size is very less, the in index is not representative of the entire population. Not only that, hunger is not an independent factor. Hunger is impacted by multiple other factors, like sanitation, lack of sanitation, water, health problems, genetics. So many other factors impact, influence hunger. So on the basis of that, or influence this, standing, wasting, etc. It is not because of lack of food. Hunger means that food is not getting enough, right? Nutrition is not getting enough. Calorie is not getting enough. But this problem might not be because of this lack of nutrition or hunger, lack of nutrition or calorific intake. These problems are also caused by some other factors like <coughs> Lack of proper sanitation, contaminated water, health of mother, genetic, genetic problem, yes. So, you are trying to link everything to hunger. Lack of food security, insecurity, nutrition, no, that is incorrect. There is no strict cause and effect relationship between the problem you are depicting and you are seeing hunger, hunger and this problem. These problems have some other causality factors. Not necessarily lack of adequate food and calorific intake. Very valid point. Okay. But the point is, okay, government is saying, yes, tell right, okay. is there really a real hunger in India? Are there any other indices which have, are there any other indices which have uh, provided, which have depicted a very poor picture? of Indian, uh, Indian nutrition level, hunger level, etc. NFHS 5 actually painted a good picture comparatively. According to, according to NFHS 5, when you compare NFHS 4 with NFHS 5, uh, except one in indicator, let's say uh, undernourishment, we have provided that, provided that undernourishment is declining in India, uh, standing and wasting is declining, child mortality has not declined as much. But this declining is compared to NFHS 4 and the decline is very less. Still there are 35% of children stunted, wasted. So it is very huge. Yes, COVID. So NFHS 5 say there are improvement but the improvement is very less per se. And the improvement is with NFHS 4, which is actually very poor. So you must, must have heard, uh, read about the air pollution situation in, in Delhi. What they say? The air quality in Delhi improved to poor. Like what I am trying to say, improved to poor. How can the improvement to poor? There is improvement from very poor to poor. Similarly, NFHS 4 can there, which is a lot of issue. Hai. So compared to NFHS 4, some improvement is there. But still, that does not mean India is hunger free. SOFI, state of food security and nutrition in the world. This also said India is facing very much hunger. W Bank, world Bank poverty recently said there are so many people who have pushed into poverty in India. You, you see other uh, indicators like consumer expenditure survey. Government has not released it so far. 2017 consumer expenditure survey has been leaked. It said Consumer expenditure, expenditure at the rural level has been declining. Urban level, marginal improvement. Unemployment is very high in India. COVID-19 crisis, you know that. How migrants have been walking. How Pradhan Mandri Garib Kalyan Yojana, a scheme initiated during COVID-19 is still continuing. Why? Agar food security problem nahi hai, kyon bhai? Band karo usko. Continuing ki nahi? On a dispassionate analysis of 
the existing problem of food insecurity in India and malnutrition, etc. It is seen that there are uh, some challenges with respect to food security in India. Clear? That should be the approach. As far as the index is concerned, it is true that the index might have or uh, index has some methodological problems. But that does not mean that whatever the index is saying is incorrect. Steps must be taken to learn from the output or results or findings of the index. And the same time the people who are making the index should try to improve the uh, construction of the index. When read, read with various other factors like unemployment, poverty, malnutrition, <coughs> and survey findings, there seems to be a very real problem of uh, proper nutritional security in India. This needs to be addressed. How it can be addressed? There are multiple schemes the government has provided. They must be addressed, they must be implemented properly. Huh, want to ask something? Puja? No. Okay. Not only that, multi pronged approach again, hunger or nutrition is not a standalone issue. You provide food that will not solve the problem. So, so, because as government rightly said, this issue of hunger, nutrition problem, etc., are also can be from health. So, a multi pronged approach, right, cutting across the domains of health, food security, employment, social justice, poverty alleviation, maternal health, right, reproductive health, pro proper schooling of children, and you, these things need to be addressed, holistic address. Holistically, systemically, we need to address the problem of hunger in India. Hunger is not a standalone issue. A convergence based approach to, to tackle the problem of hunger is required. One example today uh, in uh, India is midday meal scheme is something provided, but breakfast is also provided. Tamil Nadu has provided breakfast to children. Proper nutritious breakfast is required. Right? Because ultimately children, rightly said, but most vulnerable. That is the reason we should focus upon children too. But as far as women is concerned, women are concerned, we have ICDF, Anganwadi, etc., etc. Those systems should be strengthened. Schemes are there. Government is working, working hard to improve the situation. But, but, right, so it should continue implementing the schemes or expanding the scope, reducing leakage, etc., etc., right? also can learn from international practice. We have provided that Brazil, from Brazil, etc., right? <coughs> Some states have good development indicators. Other states can follow them. Tamil Nadu, Kerala, the southern states. And IAS officers <laughs> should also work properly. Okay? My failure of IAS, okay, hunger index may have problem in Despite India is a food surplus nation, you know that. India is a food surplus nation. Still, this problem is there. Why? <coughs> Next. Next, yeah. Drug regulation. Yes, very important. Drug regulation. I will take 10 minutes. We will finish. Drug regulation. See. Recently, more than 60 children died in Gambia. Gambia, Gambia, Africa. The allegation is that the cough syrup supplied by an Indian pharmaceutical company had some toxins, right? Ethyl, ethyl like, uh, kya hai? Ethyl, glycerol, something like that. So, leave it. Some toxins. Ah, okay. So, these toxins have caused the death of 66 around children in Gambia. Second, 
वन ज्वाइंट कंट्रोलर ऑफ ड्रग्स ज्वाइंट कंट्रोलर ऑफ ड्रग्स मतलब हाई गवर्नमेंट गवर्नमेंट फंक्शनरी अंडर सी डी एस सी ओ ये क्या है बताऊंगा सेंट्रल ड्रग्स स्टैंडर्ड कंट्रोल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन हैज बीन अक्यूज ऑफ हेल्पिंग बायोकॉन बायोकॉन मतलब वेरी बिग फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनी इन इंडिया बायोकॉन किरण मजूमदार शॉ वो नहीं है उसमें ठीक है so this person was accused he was arrested in fact he along with his accomplices were arrested and cbi is probing corruption charges there are problems of in covid 19 there has been allegations that many vaccine vaccines have been approved approved without proper clinical trial the government or the approving authorities the drug regulatory bodies have approved <coughs> many vaccines in the name of emergency use authorization emergency use authorization waiving of clinical trial because a drug drug is approved a drug is allowed to come into market there should be a clinical trial process very tedious very lengthy very scientific process first phase second phase third etc etc so during covid 19 this drug regulatory authorities have waived off many clinical trial phases डायरेक्टली बोला कि जाओ लगाओ लोगों को डब्ल्यू एच ओ दैट वाई डब्ल्यू एच ओ हैज बीन हैज डिले द अप्रूवल ऑफ मेनी वैक्सीन ऑफ इंडिया यू नो दैट नॉट ओनली दैट दिस भारत बायोटेक हैज बीन इंडल्ज इन और लेट्स इन्वॉल्व इन करप्शन चार्जेस इन ब्राजील देर आर मेनी पीपल हु हैव डाइड ड्यूरिंग क्लिनिकल ट्रायल इन इंडिया clinical trial private companies with doctors they enlist people to undergo clinical trial so instead of telling the people the proper ramification proper impacts of this drug they have been fooled even something happens to them nothing is given to them so i am just giving you an overview of, overview of the problem of drug regulation especially dealing with public health corruption in uh, this organization this child death children are dying even in jammu kashmir recently i think yes uh, more than 10 people children have died by uh, taking some cough syrup because supreme court jammu and kashmir government approach supreme court because i think the high court of jammu and kashmir asked the government of jammu and kashmir to provide compensation to children who died by taking cough syrup supreme court ne kaha bhai de do paisa i am saying it is happening not only in gambia but also in india corruption uh, proper lack of approval licensing death safety nahi hai so the which means because of these issues the regulation of drug the drug regulation ecosystem in this country needs to be revamped reformed do you remember this ed on independent regulatory body irb so in india as far as drug is concerned the drug sector is concerned regulation is done by multiple organization i will give you for, uh, frame, framework the overarching legislation dealing with regulation of drugs in india is cosmetics sorry drugs and cosmetics act 1940 kya hai kya hai drugs and cosmetics act 1940 iske andar drugs and cosmetic act rule 1945 ये लेजिस्लेशन है बस इंडिया के अंदर अंडर विच द ड्रग रेगुलेशन ड्रग रेगुलेशन मीन्स लाइसेंसिंग प्रोडक्शन अप्रूवल इंपोर्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग क्लिनिकल ट्रायल एक्सपोर्ट एवरीथिंग इज कंट्रोल्ड रेगुलेटेड दिस इज लॉ लीगल रिजीम क्या है लीगल बट लॉ तो है बट हुई इंप्लीमेंट देन कम्स द रोल ऑफ रेगुलेटरी बॉडी रेगुलेटरी बॉडी सेंट्रल ड्रग स्टैंडर्ड कंट्रोल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन 
at the union level. If the apex regulatory body with respect to regulation of drugs and cosmetics in India. Federal Drug Standard Regulation, Federal Drug Standard Control Organization is headed by a functionary known as Drug Controller General of India. Drug Controller General of India heads CDSCO. CDSCO is an attached office under Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Not an independent regulatory body. Ye nahi IRB. Ye a department ke under ek office hai. This CDSCO and DGCI are helped by because ye function jo hai inka bahut khatarnak hai technical hai based on that because there are other two bodies. Kya hai? Hmm. DFAB, Drug Formulation Advisory Board. No, no. Uh, what is the name? Drug Consultative Committee. Uh, DTAB, Drug Technical Advisory Board. Yes. A consultative committee of experts and exact name if not DCC. I am able to. Um, Say yeah. Drug Consultative Committee. Achha. Fine. So Drug Technical Advisory Board, Drug Consultative Committee help the CDSU to carry out his function or her function. Price regulation of drugs is done by National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority under Ministry of Chemical and Pharmaceutical. This NPPA enforces DPCO, Drug Price Control Order. This Drug Price Control Order is formulated under National List of, sorry, formulated under Essential Commodities Act. Are you lo. Kahi nahi milega, jok mein raun. So, NPPA, National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority, an office under Ministry of Chemical and Fertilizer. Fertilizer, right? Ministry of Chemicals and Pharmaceutical. Yes, fertilizer. Which ministry? Okay. Ministry of Chemicals. NPPA. This NPPA enforces DPCO. Drug Price Control Order 2013. Under which the drugs, there are some drugs whose prices are controlled by or set by NPPA. DPCO, Drugs Price Control Order is issued by the government under the authority of Essential Commodities Act. The drugs covered under NPPA, which means which, which all drugs are under price regulation. These drugs are part of National List of Essential Medicine, NLEM, which is promulgated by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. This is at the union level. Itna sare ministry hai, itna sare department hai, itna sare institution hai, itna sare order hai. Now come to state. State level also there are state regulatory authority dealing with manufacturing of drugs. If a drug has to be manufactured, sold in a state, approval by this is necessary. This body will have overall control over SRA, State Regulatory Authority. Generally, State Regulatory Authorities also carry out food regulation. There is something called SSI, right? SSI, FSI, Food Safety Standard Authority of India, dealing with food. So at the state level, instead of having a different authority for both, the Food and Drug Administration. This authority does the regulation of drugs. No, uh, the we no. Uh, primary, the function of this CDSCO and DCGI is to coordinate the functions of SRA. Right. It can also supervise the function of state regulatory authorities. Right. 
it is not under that that might not be a right word right because there are functional differentiation too in order to manufacture a drug in a state licensing license should be provided by sra it cannot be provided by a by the cdco license a drug cl clinical trial cdco approve a drug cdco approve hone ke baad production bhi to karna hai sale bhi to karna hai kaun karega state so this is what the ecosystem of drug regulation multiple institutions मल्टीपल एजेंसीज और इसके ऊपर आएगा ये आपका क्या है ऊपर डब्ल्यू एच ओ उधर कहां पर वर्ल्ड में और प्राइवेट कंपनी सोनी प्राइवेट कंपनी फार्मास्यूटिकल कंपनी डॉक्टर्स एसोसिएशन इट इज ए फैक्ट दैट दट रेगुलेटरी मैकेनिज्म फॉर एफ ड्रग्स आर कंसर्न इन इंडिया इज फेसिंग सो मेनी चैलेंजेस एंड सम चैलेंजेस हैव टोल्ड यू in concrete terms that death you know that the cough syrup the manufacturing company which manufactured the cough syrup did not have the license to manufacture it and sell it in india matlab jo cough syrup hai wo india mein sell karne ka power unke paas nahi tha it is only export authorized clear so if it is export authorized you know that india is what pharmacy of the world India is known for generic drugs, but the death of children, not only there, but in India, issue with clinical trials, unethical medical practices, corruption in CDS, etc., demand that we need to have an overhauling, overhauled, improved, reformed regulatory ecosystem as far as drugs are concerned in India. The greatest problem with the regulation in India is this fragmentation. now recall that pehle wala kaun chala gaya so many law i mean two laws 1940 ka law hai we are dealing with 221 22 so many institutions state level national level multiple and one of the major problem because of the institutional structure is fragmentation in the sense that no coherence no coordination kiska kaam kya hai kuch pata nahi no streamlined approach state regulatory authority red drug and cdsco their mandate is not clear there is no one single authority having control over everybody so when there is fragmentation diffuse responsibility there will be lack of accountability ye iske andar bahut sare ye bhi hai lab bhi hai many labs are there under the control of union government which test the drugs certifies it correspondingly is also there so fragmentation in the sense that there are multiple institution multiple agencies union level at the state level and there is no one single authority who have control over the entire drug ecosystem and this leading to fragmentation of functions overlapping of functions duplications diffusion of responsibility when there is diffusion of responsibility responsibility cannot be enforced accountability can be cannot be enforced clear second major problem is that recall irb independent regulatory body independent regulatory body is a body created by the legislature by law cdsco organized under ministry of health and family welfare not an independent body nppa not an independent body let's deal with cdsco it department ke under hai so it is not independent drug regulation requires independent mechanism independent authority like food and drug administration in usa and other western country independent legal independence functional organizational independence government control you know that during covid 19 cdsco icmr and other institution have been pressurized by the government it is held that because to 
way of the clinical trial, some phases. So if they are independent, they can resist. Let's assume RBI. If it is RBI, not an independent regulatory body, the government can always say the RBI, reduce inter reduce interest rate, promote growth. Kya hoga? Inflation. And this cannot function properly. Similarly, this is happening. CDF is an independent body. We need to have a foolproof, reformed, new drug, drug regulatory legislation to do away with 1940 Act, which will create an independent regulatory, independent drug regulator, like in Western nations. So that responsibility and accountability can be ensured. Clear? Another important is transparency. Kya karna transparency. The way this drug regulatory authorities function is opaque. What meeting? The, the minutes of their meeting, agenda of their meeting. These things are not published. One decision is taken. What is the basis of taking a decision? You know MPC, Monetary Policy Committee. The decision is published. Reason for decision is published. Kaun kaun kaise hai vote kiya hai, wo bhi published hai. Kyun vote kiya hai, wo bhi published. Kya fayda iska? You will come to know that why this has been taken. If it is wrong, people can criticize. Other authorities can take note of. I know that whatever I am doing will be in public domain. I will be held accountable. I will improve my work. So transparency. This is what happens in USA. In USA, to uh, approve a drug, almost 10 years is taken. 10 saal lete hai. Or jo bhi approval process hai. Everything is in public domain. Except commercial secrets. Public domain, people will, ultimately drugs are going to be administered to human, human individuals. In general. Drug kisko hoga? See, ultimately the, most of the drugs are for humans. So we should know what kind of drugs are we taking. WHO says one, in, one third of drugs in India is spurious, adulterated. The drug licensing mechanism, the regulatory approval for drugs in India is opaque, non-transparent. It's necessary that transparency must be <coughs> ensured the way this mechanism is done, the way drug approval is granted, like in Western nations. So transparency is required, institutional change is required, independence of CDFEO or other authorities should be required. We should remove, we should reform, or replace the old colonial era legislation. Government of India has also set up one committee to address the problem of drug regulation and to streamline the process of drug regulation. Functional differentiated, differentiation between state level authority and union level authority should be clearly mentioned. Who should be responsible for what? Now the problem is that interpretation of law. The law here, that is not clearly interpreted. Which means it, <coughs> what is the function of FDA, state level organization? What exactly the function of CDSEO? There is no clarity. So if there is no clarity, if something goes wrong, he will say, state wala bolega, ye tumhara kaam hai mera nahi. So tumhara galti hai, hai na? So a new law which is being in the pipeline should clearly demarcate the functional domains of each level of regulatory bodies. Okay? <clears throat> Next. Next, what is it? Chief. Uh. Up, yes, true. License means license not to manufacture. You can uh, bring that uh, drug into market. It's like product approval. 
productive is approved after trick every uh, trial and test etc but you have to manufacture it so manufacture will be done by that uh, the approval for manufacturing will be given by state level authority licensing can be both see license is what is an approval permit product licensing is fdfco manufacturing licensing is state sale licensing is state if you want to use the word licensing in that way clinical trial fdfco import of drug fdfco last topic jaldi ho gaya aaj hai na fdf very easy do you remember a lecture on fdf earlier kya tha delay in appointment of fdf delay we said that fdf needs to be appointed so fdf has been appointed by the government theek hai a lieutenant general that's not important but the point is function of fdf that you know right principal military advisor to the to the defense minister right and uh, head of head of the department of military affairs right advisor to the not advisor uh, yes a, a member of nuclear command authority apart from that cds post has some important uh, objective the reason for this post is created number 1 inter not a uh, inter service integration integration number 2 modernization number 3 theater command number 4 national security etc etc number 4 number 5 resource optimization see now we have three armed forces of the union army navy and air force army navy air force they are working under their own respective commander in chief army chief navy chief air force chief etc but this arrangement is not longer uh viable at this current situation because security challenges have uh, changed in fact increased right and modernization is required one of the reason uh, for the cds is kargil review committee and other committees the kargil review committee said that this silo like functioning departmental like functioning of these three institutions three services have been one of the major reason for lack of prompt response of india with respect to kargil war so they recommended that that there must be one single individual who will be having control over the services which means he, he can take decision so inter service integration means planning control coordination procurement everything will be done by differently by other services independent services so when you integrate all these function can be integrated or consolidated under one institution so it will improve what response functioning efficiency reduce resource uh, utilization resource optimization will be more budgeting control can be there we can save lot of time and money so integration why in the integration is also required because of theater command theater means what theater means an area having land air and water theater means if an area of war agar theater theater means theater theater is an area of A war or uh, let's say hmm. theater. Uh, let's write this way. Theater represents theater represents confluence of 
air, water, and land. Today, the war is fought not on the basis of the today the war is fought on the basis of theaters. T H E A T R E theaters. Land based war, air based war, water based war. This segregation do not exist today. So, you know, to address the problem of security and to prepare for war, what we need to have is we need to see the theater as a whole. Not this is land, so army will do. This is air, so air force. No. A theater, a region has to be seen holistically as a confluence, combination. Combo of it of all these three elements. And our strategies should be prepared, oriented towards addressing the problem of theater. We should have capability to address the issues of theater. We should have enough capability, enough capacity to satisfactorily defend and if required to commit uh, to advance offensive attacks on three fronts. Right? <coughs> So that this division of forces is based upon three different entities, land, air, water. But today it is not land, air, water, it is combination of all, even underwater, even space. So war is not fought on, on particular area or particular entity or particular element, it is combination. So hence the armed forces should also be oriented, structured, remade. Right to address the problem of theater. So theater command, instead of service specific command, which means service having their own people. Let's say Delhi. Delhi ke hai land hai. Achha, yahan pe army will be stronger. Vishaka Patnam, Pani hai. Achha, navy will be stronger. No. That cannot be an approach. In Vishaka Patnam, let's say in Andhra, interior, army will be strong. No. What we are trying to say, everything is interlinked. The war is fought on theater. If war is fought on theater, we should, we, should, we should integrate the Army, Navy, Air Force, a unit. <coughs> we should have such organization which will have people from all the three, Army, Navy, and Air Force, and they work together. Right? That is what is known as theater command. Abhi kya hota hai? There are 17 command. Command means an area which is under the control of one superior officer. 17 command, this may army command alag hai, air force command alag hai, navy ka alag hai. But we are saying that this command type system is relevant <coughs> before, let's say, 20 years. Not now. Now, instead of command, it is theater. So, in order to have theater, you know, to address the problem of theater, we should have theater based command which will have personnel from all the three. So that we will have a fighting force to address the problem of theater war. So theater command is one of the objective of CDF, right? Modernization means equipment which is our old, okay, we have to improve karna hai, modernization. Indigenization, make in India, in defense. CDF is the uh, coordinating authority under this make in India. So these are many and important functions of CDS. But what are the challenges CDS is facing? Kya challenge CDS ka? Sabse bada challenge CDS ka ye hai ki jo service in India mein. The armed forces are service conscious in the sense that inter-service integration is difficult because Today there is army chief, there is navy chief, there is air force chief. So the person has full control over their own respective services. So when you, in integration means losing control and given to some other person. So will you be in a position to give away control, power? So the existing system is something which is against the integration. Not only that, the people who are working, they say, they see themselves as belonging to their own respective service. So in order to change their mindset, in order to 
Change the approach will be very, very difficult. Which means there will be intra-service resistance against integration. One of the major reasons for delay in theater command and the other integration aspect is resistance by the Navy and the Air Force. Although they have their own reason, we are not saying that the resistance is bad or good. Second problem is Department of Military Affairs. A new department is created, Department of Military Affairs and CDS is the head of that. But what is the function of Department of Military Affairs and what is the function of Department of Defense? Clarity in here. There is no streamlined functional differentiation. The rules of business of the Union Cabinet is not clear with respect to function of DM and DOD. If it is not clear, then it will be problem of coordination. Who will do what? Who will report to whom? What is the status of the Defense Secretary and the Secretary, the DMA? Which will carry out which function? Clarity is not there. There are many overlapping issues. One of the major problems, another is CDF does not have a security of tenure. No security of tenure. Holds office until further orders. Or 65. Whichever is earlier. Kal government ko lega bhai, ye sahi nahi hai. Nikal diya. Security of tenure nahi hai, to kaise achha karega kaam? I know that I am here for almost two years, so I can plan in advance. I can work towards resolving conflicts. I feel motivated to bring changes. It will improve my efficiency and performance. No security of tenure. Another issue is modernization and indigenization. India is importing a lot of equipment. Our defense system is import dependent. How will you address this problem? This is a big challenge of CDF because ultimately he is uh, supposed to address the problem of procurement and defense modernization and indigenization. But as far as India is concerned, we are largely dependent, dependent upon the other countries. And when we are dependent upon other countries, it will re re restrict our foreign policy options. Another problem is Agnipath. Agnipath is a radical reform as far as the armed forces is concerned. Because in armed forces, earlier the shortest minimum possible service was 10 years. Officer, 15 years, other. Now it is 4 years. People going, people coming. How will you establish a system? The services are not known for this. Contractualization is something which did not happen. And it, this Agnipath scheme is supposed to be implemented by the CDS. It was the brainchild of CDS too. So the proper implementation of Agnipath scheme and its success is a responsibility of CDS. It's a new thing, right? It's a new thing. So its success is, uh, success, <coughs> the requirement of success puts major challenges on CDS. And there have been so much resistance by people also. And because of contractualization, a person who's giving, going to armed forces, he knows that I will be only serving for four years. Do you think that, think that the person will, will work properly? I know that I will be able to work for four years. So he will say, brother, there Armed forces have the work culture because of long association. <laughs> when you get into service, you know that you are there for a long time. Long time association create commitment. This is an entirely different system. I am not saying this will not be, the Agnivir will not have any commitment. I am trying to point out some issues suggested by or written by retired service chiefs and many other commentators. This is akin to, akin to lateral entry. Why the lateral entries are being, one of the major criticism against lateral entrance is this, lack of loyalty. Pata teen saal ke liye, paan saal ke liye, loyalty, po po possibility. I am not saying it is there, but this is one of the challenge. It has to address, this problem needs to be addressed. Motivation, streamlining, 
proper implementation of Agnivir scheme. There should not be any disruption between the, in the service operation. Life. It should not affect the operational capability of service. The CDS has to take care of that. Okay? So these are the challenges of CDS. How will, how will the CDS address these challenges? Yes, Karan. Some kind of, this is my own opinion, some kind of security of tenure, tenure security should be provided to CDS. The overlapping of function, lack of clarity should be between, between the Department of Military Affairs and the, your CDS should be addressed. And within, what should be the command level responsibility? Or what should be the uh, nature of relation between CDS and other army chief, army chief, air force chief, navy chief, etc. Because on, at one point in time, it is said that CDS is first among the equal. And he is not above, he cannot command or give orders to them. But if that is the case, then how the person can, if he is able to uh, implement the, the directions. See, he is first among the equal. He cannot give orders to them. This is, this is one understanding. If it is so, ultimately, for theater commands, industry service integration and other procurement, etc., they should be in line. The decision should be based upon consensus. They should listen to CDS. If they are independent, then they will not listen to CDS, na? So the nature of relationship between CDS and other services should be clearly mentioned. Abhi clarity nahi hai kya hai? Kaisa hai kya nahi hai? Some, some, somewhere you write first among the equal. Other, another, other uh, place you write or you, you uh, say that he can give some orders to them. Right? But on, right, theek hai. But on what matters the orders can be given? So clarity, we know that this is a, this is a reform, in fact this is a uh, uh, institution which is being just uh, established. We should provide some kind of time for the institution to work, to mature itself. But the problem we analyze should be addressed, right? Because national security strategy has three pillars. Kya kya hai? Operational memorandum. Operation memorandum, meaning operation directive. Operation directive, CDS, ek aur hai. Hmm. Tisra kya hai? Yes, national security strategy. National security of India, especially the military security or defense security, depends upon three major pillars. One is operational directive of defense minister. Second is CDS. Third is national security strategy. India ke andar national security strategy abhi nahi hai. Ye hai. Isho achcha kaam karna chahiye. Ye jo hai operational directive matlab defense minister provides direction, long term planning or directive to army, air force, navy and etc. But this is outdated. Bhoot purana hai. No, no. So, CDS being an important pillar of national security should be given adequate autonomy, adequate uh, sufficient enabling environment for that. Uh, the purpose for which CDS is set up is accomplished. That is what we are going to conclude. Anything else you want to ask? You can. So, any question? Revise your notes, write answers, otherwise whatever you understood today you will forget. Multiple revision is required, right? Somebody was asking for my number in the YouTube, 85 So, I will see you next time <coughs> all the best good night
Okay, welcome. All the best, and th thank you for all those people who are still, still there. Thank you, sir. Oh, everything is fine, very nice. Shiva, Prasad, uh, Ivore. Yes, I have given my number. Right, thank you so much. I hope the lecture has been helpful to you.